So let's call the meeting to order. This is the uh, January 7th, 2020 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Rob, can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Gorick? Commissioner Locks? Here. Commissioner Macchio? Present. Commissioner Volpe? Here. Alternate Albanese? Here. Alternate Coles? Here. Alternate Coviello? Here. Alternate Salvacol? Secretary Santego? Vice Chair Salka? Here. Chair Hammersley? Here. I, I did hear from uh, Peter Santago and uh, Jeff Gwork. They were not going to be in attendance tonight. Um, in place of Jeff Gwork, I'll see uh, Commissioner Albanese. And in place of Commissioner Santago, I'll see Commissioner Cole. So um, with that, I believe we have a quorum. Um, and if we can have Steve Judas lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. all remain standing for a moment of silence please great thank you good job there <laughs> um, could I get a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting so move mr. chairman second get that all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. So we'll move into the public hearing portion and uh, Mr. Lovely is here. Um, first item on the agenda, so. Do you want me to read in the uh, public oh, hearing? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, sure. I, I don't really want to, but I suppose <laughs> we have to. You do it so well. This is gonna take a while. <laughs> the Southington Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, January 7th, 20. 2020 at 7 p.m. in the Municipal Center Municipal Center Assembly Room 196 North Main Street, Southington, Connecticut for the following applications. <clears throat> A, Mark Lovely proposed zone boundary change from I-2 to R-12, property located at 136 Curtis Street. This public hearing is extended from December 3rd, 2019. B, Hunter Build LLC proposed zone text amendment for a proposed new section 3-3.10 entitled Village Residential Zone District to provide the new zone district that allows for an inclusionary village residential community use with an affordable or a workforce housing component as provided by Section 830G of the Connecticut's General Statutes, Affordable Housing Land Use Appeals Procedure, and revision to Section 7A-00. <clears throat> C. Hunter Build LLC proposed zone, zoning boundary change from R12 to Village Residential Zone District to provide more diverse housing opportunities in the town of Southington consistent and in compliance with Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statutes, affordable housing land use appeals procedure, property located at 136 Liberty Street, owned by Jamato. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Incorporated parcel size approximately 1.9 acres. D, Hunter Build LLC site plan application to permit a 30 unit multifamily residential community development with an affordable or workforce housing opportunity component consistent in compliance with Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statutes, affordable housing land use appeals procedure property located at 136 Liberty Street, owned by Jamato, incorporated parcel size approximately 1.9 acres. This is dated at Southington, Connecticut, this 19th day of December 2019. Thank you, Rob. With that, Sam, floor is yours. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. My name is Sev Bovino, Planner with Crasser Jones and Associates, representing the applicant. Um, the subject property is located at 136 Curtis Street. It is served by uh, public water and sewer. The property is uh, indicated on the screen here. Uh, this is Curtis Street for orientation purposes. Uh, that's north. This is the rail to trail. And north of this, there's a, a additional industrial areas uh, that lead eventually to Lazy Lane. Um, yeah, right. The request tonight is uh, to rezone the 21 plus or minus acres to an R12 zone, which will match the neighboring properties <coughs> to the south and to the west. These properties here to the south and to the west, the R12 zone. Um, 
this will bring the zone line to a more appropriate location, in my opinion, which is along the rail to trail heading north towards Plainville. Uh, the reasons for the requests are as follows. One, there has been a change in conditions uh, um, on this <coughs> property. Uh, the railroad is now a recreation area, which is to the east of our property. Uh, Mr. Delahunty um, has the right to build a rail spur on this property here to use the railroad, which is no longer possible. So there has been a change in the use of the rail, t of the railroad, and uh, the fact that he was planning at one time uh, when he wanted to develop the property to do a rail spur, now is no longer possible. Uh, the neighborhood is a very dense residential area. Uh, also, the industrial subdivision is not feasible, as discussed the last time. Uh, the additional tra traffic will be unsafe because of the existing road geometry, and the bridge is not designed for um, heavy truck traffic. Fifth, the request for a zone change is not considered spot zoning because we have 21 acres of property. It is also an opportunity to create R12 zoning in this town, which is always recommended in the previous uh, plans of development over the years because we don't have uh, a lot of R12 zoning in town. The commission at the last meeting requested that we look at alternatives layout. We did, and uh, I'm going to show it to you a different slide here. Can everybody hear? No? Seb, if you can just speak a little bit closer to that microphone. You can actually turn it towards you a little bit. <clears throat> okay, we we'll have a nice shutter off. A little different. What happened to the file? <laughs> no. Is it on your uh, your your mem your thumb drive there, Sev, or is it? Did you save it to the desktop? I just it just disappeared from the screen. Yeah. Presentation right here. No, but this is a different presentation. Yeah, let me get it in there. <coughs> Do you? Okay, yep. So the uh, alternate designs that we have, we have two. Um, hey, Seb, any chance that you can, you can get that a little bit bigger for people? Yes. Yeah, let me Maybe lose that. Let go back there again. Yeah. Let me pull it up. I can. This can go bigger. This can disappear. And then you can use your, your zoom buttons. Okay. Mm -hmm. This layout contemplates um, probably being developed. This again is Curtis Street. Uh, this is Ivy Drive. This layout contemplates the uh, property be developed uh, on the south side uh, with the uh, industrial, which uh, uh, there's an existing building there, planning uh, to retain that building and then add a couple of buildings, um, which that property there uh, equals about um, 3.95 acres of land, which we developed as an industrial two zone. Uh, the, the two buildings, this is an approximate layout. They're about 14,000 square feet each. Um, then we have the residential coming off of Ivy Drive and stopping before the, the zone change there, the zone line. And then to the north, the uh, property would be planned to be developed as industrial.
this is Lazy Lane to the north, so th this property here um, will be planned to be used as industrial zone by accessing the property through the neighbor and eventually leading to Lazy <coughs> Lane or to the, through the southern neighbor. Uh, Mark Lovely has spoken to both of them and they're willing to work with him on that. Um, The number of acres of uh, residential zone that we would be asking for in that case would be um, a point, this green area here. Let's see if I can reduce it. It'll be 8.28 acres in the center, and then you have the industrial zone, either a south side and north side. Um, the, the, the other layout what we're proposing is to have the residential subdivision start on Curtis Street and proceeding north as it was originally proposed and have the balance of the property here be developed as industrial. Uh, leading the same way to Lazy Lane and, and to the, this property owner here. So the, those are the two alternatives that we, we looked at. Um, this layout here will have uh, 8.4 acres of industrial zone here that be developed as uh, industrial, and the 12.2 acres will be developed as a residential at this location, which is uh, abutting totally along the uh, existing neighborhood. Uh, if you have any questions at this time, be glad to answer. Could I just ask, on, on the first option that you showed there, how many housing units are included in that? I think it's 25. 25? 25, 26. And, and in the second one? I think it's 32. 32. And in the second one, how many acres are, uh, are converted to R12? The uh, second one, the acres to R12 is 12.35 acres. Now the second one is um, 12.2 acres of uh, residential. So residential, okay. And we would uh, include a house here that's existing, which is not <coughs> under our control, but we will, including that would be about 12.7 acres to make that compliant, because that right now is a non-conforming use, industrial use, I mean industrial zone, but it's a house, it's a residential use. Okay, and then my last question is on the um, on the buildings to the north side and both of those they look like they're the same size in both, but what's the size of the size of those buildings? Do you know, yeah. roughly. <coughs> Those buildings, one is 22,500, the other is almost 11,000. Uh, so it's a total of about uh, 33,000, 34,000 square feet. Okay. And this is a prim preliminary layout. We can always modify that. Like uh, this uh, buildable area here heading west, which I'm leaving blank right now, but yeah. there's possibility this building can extend into that area. Okay. Um, any questions from the commission members? Don't see anything. Um, anything else to I add just want you, you to know that based on what you decide, I have the description of the, the boundaries of the two, two different scenarios. First, we have the, the scenario that we have the entire property that we rezone, and the description of that, it's on the application. Uh, the other two scenarios, I have the description if you decide to use one of those. Okay. For the record. Okay. Thank you. Um, no questions from the commission members. I, I guess we'll, we'll open it up to the public. Anyone here to testify in favor of this application? Mr. Chairman and fellow commissioners, Happy New Year. 
Mark Lovely, president of Lovely Development, um, located at 710 Main Street, Plantsville, Connecticut. Um, as you know, at our last meeting, we asked for some alternatives, which instead of changing the whole property to R12, we did look at this scenario. I have talked to both neighbors to the north about possibly coming through their property, and both of them are interested in talking to me. I actually, on that parcel there, I've already talked to one person that's interested in putting something there um, for a building, too, which is a good thing. But I um, just want to let you know what we would still plan on doing is doing the um, R12, doing the 55 and up, and doing the private road work like we talked about, so it's a tax benefit for the town I know you can't look at that for your type of decision but the, we're still uh, planning it looking at doing that <coughs> okay Perfect. thanks mark any Thank questions you. for mark from Commission members yes mark mr. Macchiello yes this came to me um, on this scenario this option and everything you have the access coming and that looks like a, a cul-de-sac yes at the end Yes, it is. Um, and on the other one, you had the access coming the other way. Yes. Is there a way, instead of this cul-de-sac, of having an access that go out? We could do an access to go out, yes. We could do emergency access through there. Uh, what we try to do, this is all going to be a private road network, so it won't be a town road. Um, but we can do a private access. Or what we talked about doing, I mean, and Seb even talked about, is even bringing a, um, a walkway down for the neighbors from there to be able to come right, down to get to the trail. A lot of times we've always had problems with cul-de-sacs. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, access in and out for emergency services, um, even snow removal and so on. Even though it may be private, it still does become very cumbersome <coughs> doing that. So if there was that other access, it might make it a little bit easier. Yep, we can definitely do that. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Is there anyone else here to testify in favor of this application? And I just as you're stepping to the mic, sir, I'll just remind everybody that this is the, I think the third date that we've had a public hearing on this application. Any co prior comments um, are in the record, so there's no need to repeat those, but feel free to, to say what you will. Just start with your name and your address, please, so we can get it on the record. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Happy New Year. My name is Mark Berardi. I reside at 160 Curtis Street in Southington. And I am actually um, advocating for uh, the first proposal that Mr. Lovely presented. Um, he was asked to put together the second plan. and or Yeah, the second plan. And I think the, the second com uh, plan really negates a lot of the stuff that we've already covered um, already in terms of safety, in terms of more trucks. The thing that sticks out most about that second plan is that it's, it's, it's uh, aesthetically disturbing to have R12 sandwiched in between two industrial areas. I think f from um, our standpoint, the 100 people that came out last time um, and signed the petition, this is much more feasible uh, of an option. And I think uh, economic growth without um, an investment in our neighborhoods is both, it's A, it's unsustainable, and B, it's unethical. So I would highly encourage uh, the commission to uh, please strongly consider that first proposal from Mr. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Mark, can you just do me a favor and just point out where your house is up there? Sure. My house is... Um, do, you have a, do you have a pointer? I got a... working yeah <laughs> yeah it's got it turn it on so we're right here you're right on the corner okay got it okay okay thanks mark for you coming will. out you can just leave right there yep. yeah. anyone else here to testify in favor of this application tonight don't see any anyone here to testify in opposition to this application this evening i don't see any so my, my, my feeling is that we kind of have heard everything we can hear on this. Um, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I don't know if we want to save that for the business part of the meeting. Or? Well, I think just because it's uh, evidence okay. that uh, we should be talk about okay. it during the public so, hearing. So one of the things that we had asked staff to do for us is to sort of look at a historical background on this piece of property because it seems to be somewhat unique. Um, and so Rob put together a little packet for us, and I guess we'll, we'll ask Rob to read that into the record. Yeah, just uh, one, one I forgot to mention during the, uh, the portion that was uh, public in favor. We do have one uh, submittal, 143 Curtis Street, Amanda Stern, that was in favor of this. Um, <clears throat> or I should say the most recent revision, I guess. 
All right, so <clears throat> what I did was, uh, at the request of the chair, I put together a quick history of the site, uh, which was, um, it's really limited. There really isn't a permit history or an application history here, except for uh, a couple of, I think there was a uh, office rehab and a, uh, an accessory structure that was applied for. Um, that's really all we have in our, in our records. But what I did do is I <clears throat> referenced the historical zoning maps that we have on file. Thankfully, we've collected those over the years since the, since the uh, advent of the zoning regulations in 1957. And I also looked at the uh, aerial imagery from the uh, Yukon Magic uh, uh, online files. Uh, they date back to 1934. So I provided all this to you uh, for your review digitally and uh, a copy in front of you as well, too. But just to kind of quickly summarize, uh, on May 20th, 1957, the area in question uh, at the, of the hearing tonight was uh, zoned R25. And it did have a B2 business uh, zoning classification along the frontage of Curtis Street, some, some distance back. I don't know the exact distance there, um, but it's likely to be anywhere from two to 500 feet. Um, <clears throat> May, on February 2nd, 1962, the zoning map reflected the property was in an R25 with the B2 along the frontage as, I, as it was in 1957. Uh, and there was a new I-1 zone along the Lazy Lane uh, area, mostly east of the railroad line. And this appears to be where, as we know, SRS Solvent Recovery is located today. <clears throat> uh, September 9th, 1966, the I-1 expanded south on the easterly side of the railroad. Uh, from the SRS area and appears to, uh, in 1966, contain where Stephen Tire is, is located today. I don't know whether they existed back then or not, but that, but clearly that area was, uh, was an industrial use at the time. And then on October 21st, 1971, there was a massive town-wide rezoning effort. Um, the result of this was a conversion of the I-1 zones that I had referenced just, just prior, uh, becoming I-2, and uh, it also added the property known as, as, as this uh, property here, 136 Curtis, in its entirety on the west side of the railroad. So the whole area became I-2 in 1971. There was reference uh, in the meeting minutes that we had, which the minutes are very uh, limited back then. They just basically say you met and you left and that was it. You know, a couple of references of what may have happened. Um, but the meeting minutes reference a document entitled 28 Reasons for the Zone Change, to, for the Zone Changes. Um, that document and the whole file associated with that is missing. We couldn't find any evidence of, of it at all. I checked with multiple departments to see if I could chase that document down, uh, and it was unsuccessful. Um, but you can only assume uh, that uh, the change in this property was a reflection of the existing use at the time, uh, at, at the time of 1971. So it looks as though they, they call this I-2 because it was an industrial-type business uh, commercial use at the time. So then <clears throat> looking at the aerial imagery in 1934, as was the case in most of Connecticut, the property's active farmland. That's usually what you see when you look around Connecticut, except for some of the more developed areas back then. 1966 aerial, sh the property shows the, uh, the main structure that's in place now, along with what appears to be storage of materials to the north, consistent with what we see out there today. So sometime between 1934 and 1966, something happened that was being used as an industrial business property. Uh, again, in 1990, it appears generally the same as in 1966. In 2006, uh, the property still had the structure there, but it, it appeared predominantly empty. This could have been just a change in tenant. Uh, there's no proof of uh, a t intent to abandon there, um, because then again, in 2017, uh, the structure is still there. Uh, we do have a better resolution at that time. We can clearly have it, we clearly have evidence of storage materials in the same general areas in 1966. So, looking at the assessor's card from 1960, and I guess they, as I understand, they only had a card for each decade back then. They started keeping records, um, and the card from the 1960s, which could have been anywhere from 1960 to 1970, the notation says land used for commercial purposes. So. At some point in time before 1966, this was uh, an, an industrial commercial operation. Uh, I don't know the exact date. It could have been 1960. It could have been prior to 1960. It certainly was after 1934. And that's the summary of the uh, report. Okay. Is it appropriate now, Rob, to talk about the uh, enforcement actions that we, we've had, or, or do we want to save that for later on? No, we, we can talk about that. Um, we did receive a complaint, um, I guess, several years ago. 
So just a framework for people who, who yeah. weren't here for the last couple of public hearings, we have had an ongoing conversations about the tenant that currently occupies that property and what type of enforcement effort has been made to, to, uh, to make them a little bit more friendly, let's put it that way, I guess. Yeah, so I, within the last two or three years, we received a complaint uh, that the uh, vegetative buffer was removed. Um, you know, staff, myself, we, we went out to the site to basically witness what was the activities that were going on on site. We did witness that the, the buffer was removed. Uh, it was alleged that it was full of invasives and that uh, the tenant was removing those invasives. But it was pretty clear that uh, that whether that was the case or not, um, there was an intention to expand the area where they were where they were storing materials. So, uh, as a result, uh, we basically uh, informed them that they needed to reestablish that buffer, move the uh, Jersey barriers that were pushed back back to where they were, the original extent of the uh, of the uh, land use, backfill it, and then replace it with with a new vegetative buffer. Now, the tenant went uh, did that and actually went on site and and removed some mature vegetation replanted it which we highly doubted would last i was actually out there on site today and i can confirm that certainly some of those specimens have not survived um, there really needs to be a, a replanting schedule with uh, nursery type specimens in that area uh, as far as the uses on site there was some um, i guess reclaimed concrete or not concrete reclaimed asphalt tailings there was a state job i think that the the tenant had entered into uh, we told them that, you know, that's something that would need an approval. He removed everything from the site, there, and we were out there today. We didn't see any evidence of any of that any of that work. It's just basically storage of um, box ends, uh, tr uh, tr some tractor trailer ends. There's some vehicles there. There may be, may be a blight situation for a vehicle or two that we have to address after the visit today. Um, there's some carnival equipment. There's some golf carts, uh, you know, just various items of storing storage nature on site. So, um, you know, we have had an enforcement procedure with them and uh, certainly there may be a couple of things to button up again, but. And that's an ongoing effort um, yeah, currently underway. And, and w just for informational purposes, what's the size of the buffer? Uh, it's supposed to be 30 feet uh, according to the regulations, but it's not, it was never that deep to begin with. Okay. I don't okay. know the exact measurement okay. right now. I just we just know where the where the actual disturbed line was, and and the fact that they moved into that, we we pulled them back again. Okay, I see our esteemed guest Lou Perillo is waving at me and has asked to come give us some testimony. If I may, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, as far as a compromise, your name and your address, uh, Lou, Lou Perillo, uh, Tom Southington's economic you. development director. Thank you. <laughs> as far as a compromise goes, I'm not so sure how losing 12 acres or more of industrial development is a compromise to our town. Um, the land that we're getting is under the easement for industrial use. Pretty much already have that. Um, there's nothing saying that once it's R12, it doesn't go into a higher density. I mean, I, I do believe the developer is going to do what he says. But there, uh, if you saw um, one of the plans where we're actually losing an industrial building on top of it, um, y you know, another 3.9 acres, you know, I think the commission has to look into how is that a compromise. And I agree with uh, Mark Brunello that sandwiching an R12 in the middle of a, an I-2 isn't appropriate. But, you know, there's not the way the discussion is framed you know there are several choices one is to allow it to remain industrial it doesn't have to be one two or three you know or one or the other of the plans that were shown um you know as far as the railroad goes the railroad it's been a linear trail for a long time mm -hmm. that's not even a point the bridge i don't think is an issue either you know our bridges have to handle what they have to handle um as staff uncovered that it's not a pre-57 use per se, because there were zone changes in there. We are missing the 28 reasons. You know, 28 reasons, quite a bit. It's not one or two. So without having that information of why the zone change occurred, you know, again, I think it's time for the commission to reflect, how are we gonna make up 12 to 20 acres of industrial? Right. Where are we gonna make it up? And quite frankly, um, I'm concerned about setting a dangerous precedent uh, with our other zones. This, you know, when you buy a home next to, an industrial area, there are certain uses that are allowed in an I-2 zone, and people are permitted to have the privacy and respect of their own homes, as do the businesses. 
So I think there are some enforcement issues that could be compromised. That's where I think the compromise comes into. Um, but to forever lose, what's going to stop the next I-2 piece? Because, hey, you know, no one wants to have this and everything. You know, previous testimony for 19 years, no issues. It's, is it really the zone? You have to ask yourself. Or is it the current use that might be able to have a compromise where people could use the zone effectively in good harmony with the neighborhood? Well, I, I, I think, Lou, you know, if, if I can, and, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, although I think some people up there might share my sentiment, part of this is a tenant issue, right? Part of what is driving our concerns is the fact that we've had 100 people who have come up here or signed a petition or testified in some manner where they have a problem with the current person who's there, right? So what efforts, if any, have you all made or are you going to make to try to market that and, and replace it? that tenant and try to get something in there that's a little bit more conducive with a, a friendly neighbor situation, I, I guess is my question to you. Well, I don't think you necessarily have to replace the tenant. You have to find a balance between, you know, harmony, and that's where a compromise comes in. It, it, you know, if the tenant was there prior to some complaints, yeah, there were some activities. I mean, tenant's been there for a while. The activities of recent of some of the welding and the light and the clearing you know, because more use came out involved. And, and we can, you know, approach this commission for another property should the, you know, your decision go. We, we do have another place for him to go. Um, I can tell you I-2 is very valuable. We are talking with three people for a property on uh, in, in another area of town that's going for quite a bit of money, um, over $100,000 an acre, because mm -hmm. uh, it's combined in the location and whatnot. Real estate's all location. but the use is an important use for our community. If you look at um, Supreme Forest products, they're in an I-2, all right? Um, a lot of people came forward at that meeting. They didn't want them there. If you go there, it's clean, it's productive. You know, there are no smells coming from the food waste to energy plant. So I, I, again, I, I'm not going after the person who is the tenant. It's just, is there a way of getting harmony within the neighborhood? <coughs> um, you know, and if a change comes through the ownership you know, much of it is through the ownership and maintaining decorum, right. and, you know, and if when an ownership transaction occurs, we it's no longer pre-57. I think there's some enforcement we could take. Yeah, and, that, and I'll remind the, the members that a, a zone change goes with the property. Anything we do here goes with the property. It doesn't go with the person. So Mark Lovely can leave the scene, and that zone change, if we approved it, maintains on that property until we take a step to to reverse that back, which I think everybody agrees would not happen if we did that, right? You raise the issue of precedent, right? I've heard this over the last couple of days, precedent. I don't know whether Rob or, or Jeremy want to talk about what, what precedent is going to be set if we decide to approve one of the three options that change this, this zone. Is there any precedent or, is, or, or how strong would that be? So, so, so again, the idea is that if we if we approve a, a zone change here, in some manner, whether it's completely changing it to R12, or changing it under one of the two scenarios that were presented tonight, that there's going to be a precedent set for this commission on future applications. I'm just wondering how strong is that, and what does that mean for future commissions should a similar application come in front of us. Well, generally speaking, um, if you approve this uh, under the conditions that you're having here today, you really can't uh, turn down future projects that have similar conditions, similar situations. So that's basically you cannot di discriminate based on, um, you know, different industrial locations if they have the same general specifications. So I guess you could look at it that way as a you're setting a precedent if you change something. But so if I'm I mean, every. Every, you got to look at every situation independently, of course, but um, if you show that you're doing it this time, right. obviously, that's something that can move forward in, in other applications. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Attorney, uh, Attorney Taylor, is that if, if we approve this in some way, make a zone change here, and 10 years from now someone else comes in who wants to <clears throat> convert an I zone to an R12 zone, they can cite this as a reason why that should happen is that correct or I would if I was <laughs> gonna yeah. put the application for it 
Okay. And, and if I may, Mr. Hammersley or Chairman Hammersley, uh, uh, in the commission as well, if you look at the POCD, the number one thing on our plan of conservation and development, which was just done several years ago, was basically open space and less housing. So again, it'd have to be explained to me how changing from the plan of conservation and development, adding more houses with the type of density on this land, you know, and you asked if, it, even if it were vacant, I think people would be happier than if, uh, you know, uh, it were converted over to residences from the holistic view. You know, I understand the neighbors, we're gonna face that with everyone. Matter of fact, if you <coughs> approve this, what do you think the people who are living in these homes that you approve are gonna think about on the other side of the power line? Okay. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, commission members, I'm just, I'm just wondering if anyone <coughs> said, I'm sorry, I'll give you a last, Last crack here. Yep. Um, just want to respond to some of the comments. Uh, zone changes uh, over the years have been done, uh, and they're taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And yes, they can use uh, some um, examples, but the property that would be considered 10 years from now I would have to have the same general conditions. In other words, being next to a highly dense residential uh, neighborhood, there was a major change in use in the area, the rail, the trail uh, used to be a railroad. Uh, the need of the community, I, I see this as being actually an opportunity. You have a developer that is willing to come in and put an over 55 community, which uh, doesn't cost the town money. Uh, the town makes money on that. And the uh, industrial zone, if left the way it is, will all, always be used as a one site, not as a subdivision. So you'll be one tenant, for the entire site because it doesn't make sense to spend uh, money that needs to be spent to put a road in. Um, and so you'll, right now I believe it's seven to $8,000 worth of uh, taxable property there, uh, uh, seven to $8,000 of taxes per year on this property. And if you get into the over 55, uh, 30 units, you're talking a lot more money than that. So it is an opportunity, in my opinion, and the zone doesn't really tie your hands or any other commission's hands because you look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I appreciate that. Mark? Yes, hello again, Mark Lovely. <clears throat> As I stated before in the past, um, you have a use that's there right now that if I don't do something with this property, that's going to stay there. And so you're, you're talking about economic development. You take and put the industrial out back or in the industrial out front in the houses, and you're talking $200,000, $250,000 in taxes. Right now you're getting $8,100 in taxes, and that this person's going to buy this property, and that's going to stay there, a trucking company. Um, I'm here because of the neighbors and trying to help them out to, to, to satisfy all the problems that the town's been having. I mean, we've got trucks there, like you say, that's had sewage there. You have people that can't even keep their windows open in the summer because the trucks are running. you got trucks running at night right now. I've driven by there the other day. The police were out there again. So they can't say there's not problems there, which there is. Um, but, I mean, economic development, I know that we don't like to lose industrial, and I said that in my first thing. I don't like to see industrial, but if you look at the subdivision we tried to create here, you can't put a road in and physically do it for what the cost of the property is. It just doesn't make sense. So it has to be a one-off one user, and this is your one-off user. So if you want, they want to keep dealing with the problems and stuff, that's what they're going to end up having because he's going to be the one that purchases it. Unfortunately, that's how it is, and I don't, I'm not trying to hold that over your head, but I just want to state that fact like we talked about before. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. So, Commission members, I'm, I'm kind of of the mind that we've kind of heard everything that we're going to hear on this, and if if anyone disagrees with me, please let me know. But I, I'm kind of thinking that we close the public hearing at the time on at this time on this, and and then move forward as part of the business meeting to try to see what we're going to do. Uh, so, anyone? Mr. Chair, can I just ask two questions? Yeah. That's being leaked to the party a little bit. Mr. Sure. Coles, yes, please. <coughs> Better. Better. Get nice and close to it. Um, so I, I actually have two quick questions, one for Rob and one for Lou. Um, so Rob, it, is there, with regards to the concerns of the neighbors, and you kind of mentioned the, the code enforcement aspect of, of how you've approached it, but with regard to all the, the, 
the concerns that Mr. Lovely just mentioned, can we enforce our way out of those problems? Is, it, is, is there a feasible way to address the concerns of the neighborhood through code, code enforcement? I think the only thing that's remaining is a resolution to the vegetative buffer that was removed. I, I, I in my professional opinion, it's, it's been a storage type of use, land use, going back to the 60s. Um, <clears throat> that's an allowable use in an I-2 zone. So, um, you know, and I'm not an attorney, but as far as I've been educated over the years is that if, if there's a use that's in plain sight that hasn't received enforcement, and I don't even think this is a, a use that's not allowable in the zoning regulations, that, you know, you really, you really don't have much of a, of a case against it. You know, that said, I mean, if the commission feels as though there's, there needs to be something done, we could always try something, but, um, you know, it's... I, you know, there's no site plan on record for this use because it's so old, the type of use, although the regulations did, did call for site plan approval back then, uh, since the beginning of the, the zoning regulations were created. Um, but as I understand, there's many uses in town that didn't receive a site plan back in the 60s. So it's just one of those, one of those things where it's just been there, and I just don't see a compelling reason of a substantial change in use over there, in, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, Commission, you guys have the, uh, the final authority on that. And with regard to, like, later evening events, um, work after hours, after 5 o'clock, is there any uh, regulatory authority that yeah, we Yeah, we don't, we don't have any, uh, any rules uh, relating to that in the zoning regulations. You know, I know noise is an issue that some people speak of, um, but we have no effective noise ordinance. We have a construction noise ordinance for construction activities, uh, you know, associated with building something. Um, but in this case, you know, if there's some noise coming from the site at 10:30, 11 o'clock at night, it's not something the zoning enforcement officer could, could take care of. If it's a, if it's a an impact to you know the peace and quiet of the neighborhood, that's something they could contact the police department about, and maybe there's something they can do about it. But from a zoning standpoint, no. I mean, from a from a public health perspective, through public health nuisance laws, with I, mean, I know you're not a a health guy, but through our Health district, could they have they been at least circled in on the problem? I think their their scope would be a little too narrow for the land use. I mean, unless there's some kind of a, a vector or varmint of some sort that's um, you know coming from the site or being attracted to the site, I I don't see that they would have any influence or jurisdiction there. Uh, there may be a couple of vehicles on site that are that are inoperable that aren't registered. That may be a blight issue that we can take care of. But that's you know that's just a couple of vehicles. So. The activity of, of a of a storage facility of, of materials mm -hmm. is is an allowable use in an I two zone. So, and there's really no there's no, there's no area requirements. There's no if you go to an I one zone, there is area requirements. You have to have a, a specific area to store things. But I two is your highest, uh, your heaviest industrial zone. Is basically what it comes down to. <clears throat> Thank you. And then if I could just ask Lou one question also. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, the I-2 zone, if we were to lose something like that, um, it would be lost forever. And my big question is, what's the marketability of a, of a location like that? You had talked a little bit about some other locations zoned similarly. Um, if we were to keep this as an I zone um, and the current tenant um, in 50 years or 20 years left, would somebody replace them? And what kind of... Uh, potential could that be? And I know I'm kind of asking you to look through the looking glass on this, but um, I'm trying to be forward thinking, you know, for the town over the next decades, what could we expect if it was to remain an I zone? Well, I think you're m more than likely you're always going to need some sort of industrial use to service the town. All right. Uh, if you're going to have trees, they're going to have to be maintained by somebody. They're going to have to be stored. Um, marketability, from what I understand, there's two interested parties, you know, um, Mr. Lovely and the current tenant. So, you know, I-2 is fairly rare because it's um, hard. Nobody wants to be near them. So where are you going to park triaxles? If you think in 50 years we're going to have dump trucks, where are you going to park them? <coughs> it, it, you know, if you're going to have buses in 50 years, I don't know what we're going to have with autonomous driving and whatnot. 
but that's kind of where the inventory is. Um, you know, who would have ever thought you need a distribution facility for uh, Amazon? Right now, everything is the last mile. So they're talking about mobility solutions for the last mile, you know, pop, little, basically robots, little carts to go from an area to the last mile. They're talking about drones. So I, I don't know 50 years from now, although I do know um, human beings being what we are, there's always going to be a need um, for trash, recycling, something along those lines. I'm not saying that this is a site, but when you look at, again, Supreme Forest Products that has expanded to almost 45, 50 acres um, using the old landfill, uh, you get to see a food waste to energy plant not in our regs, and we had two of them come forward. Where would you put something like that? And you know, where are you going to put solar? Um, as the applications get into nanotechnology, smaller uses for the parcel, you're still going to need parcels. If my concern is it's nice to even have the inventory, all right, because of 50 years from now. Um, if they're houses, they're houses. I don't think our town, uh, according to the POCD, needs many more houses in the sense that there's other opportunity for land. It's just not marketed right now. But, you know, as people age and their children have moved out of town, you see properties are coming up for sale. And for me, as a town, I would want to hold it in inventory for the future. I hope that explains. Good. Thank you. So, so I'll go back to where I was. You're all set now. Thank you. Um, I'll go back to where I was. I, I'm not sure that there's a need to keep this public hearing open unless, uh, Seb, I keep trying to do this and someone's got something. Go ahead. Um, I failed to mention this before, Mr. Chairman. Um, you just talked into the mic. I failed to mention this before. Um, now that I hear Lou uh, mentioning about continuing the use of industrial um, even if the current situation gets rectified, I just want to refresh your memory on the uses they're allowed in this zone. Uh, will be building materials, sales and storage yards and buildings, storage of construction materials, including pipes, storage and repair construction equipment, storage of well drilling equipment, trucking terminals. These uses are not conducive to be carried out in this area for the issues they have brought up in terms of uh, the road geometry, uh, the roads are not designed for this kind of uh, truck traffic. Just want to remind you of that. Thanks, Seth. <coughs> are we ready to close it? Okay, so we'll close the public hearing on, on that agenda item, and we'll move on to agenda item 7B. So, so let me just, um, I was going to do a couple of things before we get started here. One, one is I'll, I'll read, um, we're going we're to take the next three items which all pertain to the same property um, as one public hearing. So B, C, and D, I'm going to read those for the record. Item 7B is Hunter Build LLC proposed zone text amendment for a proposed new section 3.10 entitled Village Residential Zone District to provide for new zone district that allows for an inclusionary village residential community use with an affordable and workforce housing component as provided for in section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes, affordable housing, land use appeals procedure, a revision to section 7A-00, that's zone amendment number 603. Item number C, Hunter Build LLC proposed <coughs> zoning boundary change from R12 to Village Residential Zone District to provide for more diverse housing opportunities in the town of Southington, consistent and in compliance with Section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes, Affordable Housing Land Use Appeals Procedure, property located at 136 Liberty Street, owned by Giamato, am I saying that right? Uh, Inc., parcel size approximately 1.9 acres, and that's zone change number 563. Item D. Hunter Build LLC site plan application to permit a 30 unit multifamily residential community development with an affordable housing or workforce housing opportunity component consistent 
and in compliance with Section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes, Affordable Housing Land Use Appeals Procedure, property located at 136 Liberty Street, owned by Giamano Inc., parcel size approximately 1.9 acres, and that special permit application 1792. I have got to recognize you in one second. Before we get started, I want to ask Attorney Jeremy Taylor, our town attorney is in attendance this evening. I want to ask him to frame the conversation tonight because we are bound by certain things that are contained within general statute of what we can talk about because this is an, a sec, pertains to section 8-30G. It's different than what we typically would do. So I'll, I'll ask Attorney Taylor to frame that conversation for us, please. Thank you, Chairman Hammersley. Um, for you, many of you who may not know, I'm Jeremy Taylor, I'm the town attorney. Um, briefly, just in efforts uh, to keep this process moving uh, quickly and smoothly, as the commission will be hearing the three-part application concerning the affordable housing land use uh, governed by uh, general statute 8-30G. Um, just a little bit of guidelines for the commission or the general public that may not be familiar with this statute. Uh, under the statute, uh, the task uh, put forth to the commission today is to judge the application on the basis of whether the overall plan and location is in any way adverse to the public interest in regards to possible health or safety concerns. That's what uh, the guidelines generally that you should be looking at with this application today. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. With that, if the applicant can step up, state your name and, sure. and address for the record and, and take it away. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, town planner uh, Phillips, town engineer Capone, and town attorney Taylor, and Madam Clerk. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Smith. I am a land use attorney with the law firm of Alter and Pearson. And two uh, housekeeping matters, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, first, happy and healthy new year to you and your families. Thank you. And, um, and then I have a copy of the receipts that I sent of the notice of the filing of this application to the Connecticut DPH as well as to the Southington Water Department. Uh, under Statute 8-3I, if you're potentially in a watershed, which I don't believe we are, uh, you're supposed to notify both DPH and any water company that may have a watershed under the property. Again, it's our understanding we don't, uh, but just as a matter of course, I always send notices to everybody. I know uh, the Perception section sorry, chief at DPH right? is not happy with me sometimes, but, uh, but I've known her for a long time and she accepts these. If you so can just hand that to Robin, it will be right. part of the record. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I appear before you this evening on behalf of Hunter Build LLC concerning, as was indicated in the legal notice, three different applications that are associated with a proposed 30-dwelling, a 30-dwelling residential community known as Center Point Crossing for real property that is known as 136 Liberty Street. Specifically, we have three applications that are related, and this is how you file this. You can file it this way uh, when dealing with 8-30G, and I'll get to that in a moment. The first is a zone text amendment, and that's a proposed text amendment to create a new section 3-10 that's entitled Village Residential Zone District, VRZD. The second is a request to change the zone district designation of the subject property on Liberty Street from its current zone designation of R12 to the new uh, village residential zone district. And then the third application is a site plan application that has the site development uh, proposal consistent with the zone text amendment we proposed to the commission for the 30 unit or 30 dwelling multifamily residential community. As the chair indicated and as was discussed by Town Attorney Taylor, and I'd just like to state this on the record, it's one of the requirements, it is this residential community will have a workforce or con affordable component uh, as provided or required by Section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes, and we'll get to that in a moment. At the outset, I would like to introduce the members of the team that are here this evening. Uh, we do have representatives for, for, uh, of Hunter Build LLC. Our planning consultant, Brian Miller, he is AICP certified. We'll be hearing from Brian shortly. Our licensed surveyor is Steve Judas, and professional civil engineer is Michael Lambert, uh, both of Henry Cole and Son, with offices located here in Southington. Our traffic engineer is Scott Hesketh, 
and our fire safety expert is Joseph Versteeg. At the outset, what I'd like to do is um, the way that this format that we'd like to do the presentation for the commission and to the members of the public is that I would just like to provide an overview of what's in front of you this evening. I will be relying and walking through essentially the summary letter, the cover letter that was, for, was submitted with the application that's dated November 18th, 2019. I'll come back to that. Then we'll hear from our planning consultant, Brian Miller, about the zone text amendment and the affordability plan that was submitted with the applications. Under 830G, you have to submit an affordability plan, and Brian will walk you through that and explain not only for the commission, but also for the uh, public, uh, what is meant by an affordable component. And I think many people might be surprised with that. We'll then hear from Steve Judas, who will walk you through the site development proposal, the site plan application, and the specifics with regard to that. Uh, after Steve, we'll hear from Scott Hesketh, who will, our traffic engineer, who will address his traffic study and report that was submitted as part of the application. We'll then hear from Joseph Versteeg, who is a fire safety expert, uh, well-respected throughout the state of Connecticut. And then finally, we'll circle back to Brian Miller, who will uh, walk you through and provide you with a summary of his planning analysis that was submitted with the application as well. So at the outset, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, I'm going to, I would just like to walk everybody through. If you don't, I have hard copies of this, but I understand everybody has tablets I'm pretty uh, challenged when it comes to technology, so if anybody wants a hard copy, I'm more than happy to give it to you. But it's a, it's a six-page letter uh, from myself to the chair and to the members of the commission. It's dated November 18, 2019. And, um, and I'm just going to summarize. I'll read from parts of it, but I'm not going to read the whole letter to you. But as you can see at Thank the first you. page, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, at the, the ray, the heading, it makes reference to the three uh, specific applications. Then we have the applicant, the property address, and then the notice that it is all three components of this proposal are filed pursuant to 8-30G. Just starting down at the bottom, the applicant is contract purchaser of the subject property. And for the record, as provided by 8-30G, the applicant will be the proposed developer of the set-aside development uh, that is the subject of the application. Set-aside development is uh, defined uh, by 830G, and, and that's what we've submitted, and we'll walk you through that in a moment. The new residential community, as I indicated, will have an affordable or workforce housing component, and this will provide housing for mixed-income families throughout the town. An overview of the proposal, the property, Steve was kind enough to set this up for me with the aerial, which I asked for, so Steve, I'm, here we go, I think I, here we go. So the property is, um, is outlined in blue, and we have Liberty Street is running to the east. The property is approximately 1.98 acres, and as I indicated before, is located in the R12 zone district. It is currently undeveloped. It has historically been utilized for residential related uses. It does have access to both public water and public sewer, and there is more than adequate public sewer, there is more than adequate sewer capacity, excuse me, to serve the proposed multifamily residential community. The community will have six uh, one bedroom dwellings or apartments and 24 two bedroom dwellings or apartments for a total of uh, 30 dwellings. They'll be located in a single L-shaped building, and again, uh, Steve will walk you through that uh, and all the specifics in a moment. The building will be sprinklered and, and comply with all fire state safety requirements, and Mr. Versteeg will touch upon that later in his presentation. The proposal uh, provides for rental dwellings. It has an internal driveway system that will be private with full access to Liberty Street. There is a secondary access for emergency purposes only to West Center Street, which is located just to the north of the property. And Steve will walk, touch upon that in his presentation. And there is a designated pedestrian walkway uh, that will be provided in the proposal out to Liberty Street from the site. There are no wetlands or water courses located on the property. The water management system is consistent with municipal requirements and is designed to accommodate up to the 100-year storm event. And now turning on to page three and to the second paragraph, the proposal includes an affordable or workforce housing component as provided by Section 8-30G. 
And what this means is that the proposal has to provide for at least 30 percent of the total number of dwellings, or in this case nine, that would qualify with restrictions as to families that the units can be rented to. And specifically, four of the uh, units or dwellings have to be rented and will be rented to persons or families at the 80 percent median income. And Brian will walk you through what that means in a moment. And then five dwellings have to be uh, rented at rates that are to individuals who are persons or families at the 60 percent median income. These rental prices target families with incomes compar comparable to many of Southington's Municipal and Board of Education employees, and, and Mr. Miller will touch upon that a little more in depth in a, sh in a, in a moment. There will be deed covenants that will run on the property for 40 years, indicating that these rental restrictions apply to this property. So going forward, uh, that's how the, the statute is set up. So there, there will be restrictive covenants, and we've drafted we have a sample uh, lease restriction that's attached to the affordability plan uh, for your uh, consideration. And again, the affordable or workforce housing component in this 30, 30 dwellings uh, will provide for uh, additional and more diverse housing opportunities for folks and, and families and individuals here in the town of Southington. Now, it's going to the bottom of page three, workforce housing need. The, general, uh, the Connecticut uh, General Assembly has authorized the Connecticut Department of Housing. They, they've generated a list where if towns don't provide, th those towns that do not have uh, at minimum 10 percent of their housing that qualify as workforce or for affordable, then someone such as my client can come in with an application being submitted under Section 8-30G. It's, it's called the 10 percent list, and as it's indicated, uh, going to page four, uh, the Southington does have, going down to the third full paragraph that starts with although, and although the so-called 10 percent list mandated by the Connecticut Department of Housing, DOH, to identify municipalities are permanent, that are permanently exempt from 8-30G is not strictly speaking a measure of housing need. It is an indication of a municipality's lower cost housing stock relative to other municipalities in the state. And um, again, only Southington ha only has 5.38% or 930 units in town that qualify as workforce out of 17,447. And as I indicated at the uh, top of the page, this, this three-step process, three-application process has been utilized throughout the state. I mean, I've done it numerous occasions through towns, literally throughout all the uh, uh, different counties. And again, we have a text amendment that creates a new zone because that proposal that is submitted to you, the site development proposal, does not comply with any of your regulations. So we've drafted a text amendment, a new zone, that that site development will comply with. And that is, again, that is the first application. And, and again, it, it provides for uh, housing where y you do have the 30 percent requirement as provided by or required by Section 8-30G, 30 percent of the total having to qualify as workforce or affordable. And that's at the bottom of page four. There's a reference to the proposed new village residential zone district. Turning the page to the top of page five, we have the zone change. Again, the second application. Mr. Miller will walk you through the text amendment, give you a little summary of it. It's not that involved, but it does provide for some bulk area requirements and some other restrictions. And one of the purposes of that is to actually have guidelines going forward. So if anything is, go if the site, there's any modifications to it, uh, there are bulk area requirements that do apply under uh, the zone text amendment. <coughs> Second application, again, is to change the zone designation of the subject property, very simple, from an R12 to this new zone. I know we have the, the application in front of us was to go from the uh, industrial uh, to, uh, to an R12. And then finally, we do have the site plan application. And uh, the text amendment, as Mr. Miller will explain to you, does provide for any development proposal that's submitted under this new zone district uh, will be subject to your site plan requirements. So with, unless anybody has any questions for me, 
I'll stand down and I'll let Mr. Miller come up and he will address the text amendment and then the affordability component with this proposal. Well, I, I think we'll let you go through your entire presentation and then we'll and then we'll open it up to questions. So, so why don't we proceed in that? Okay, in perfect. That okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Steve. Um, there aren't that many. Uh, Could you just state my, your name? My name is Brian Miller. And your, and your affiliation here? I'm a, uh, the principal with a planning consulting firm of Turner Miller Group, New England, in uh, Wallingford, Connecticut. Thank you. I've, um, I just wanted to say th um, that uh, I appreciate the technical assistance here. Um, not many uh, commissions are doing this yet. Um, I was asked to do um, a couple of things in, in support of this application. And by the way, I've been a, um, a planner in Connecticut for over 30 years, and I've worked with this 830G quite a bit over the years, more times than not on the municipal side. But um, we've, I have uh, worked in uh, different situations. Now, I've, I was asked to participate um, in this in, for several functions. One is to assist in writing the uh, regulations, which I'll go over in a moment. The second is um, to prepare the affordability plan, which is required under state law under Section 830G to be part of any application. And the third was to do a planning analysis. Um, as your attorney uh, mentioned, it's, it, there is kind of a, a negative finding um, requirement, but we think that this application actually is very beneficial to the town and even without the uh, affordable component. Um, I'm also going to use the word affordable. Uh, Chris used workforce. I'm using the term affordable because that's how it's referred to in the statutes and that's it's kind of out of habit I'm using it. Now you can see here we've outlined this um, on the um, on the chart there, this is the um, subject property, and it's on a zoning map. And you can see it's surrounded by, it is currently R12, this yellow is R12. But it's also I important to note that this purple over here is the central business zone. So what actually abuts the central business zone in three places here, kind of across the street from that, and these two little feet there. So it's not out in the middle of nowhere. It's actually in the core of the community. I think that's an, a, an essential element here. The new zone, we try to provide it as simply as possible in conformance with your, um, with the general style that you have in your regulations. There's restrictions on location. Um, it has to be in an R, with an existing R12 zone within one half mile radius of the intersection of Maine and Columbus. And that, that's really to keep it in that core area. Um, the intent and purpose is, is to provide housing that's appropriate in the core of the community as well as uh, affordability. The permitted uses are really down to just multifamily. So the only thing that people are gonna, that's gonna happen here on this is multifamily. Um, it's tied to the site plan, so the requirement to come in um, and get this is, is, is linked to a certain site plan. So, you know, just because we have it, we're not going to be able to put up a, uh, anything more intense uh, or much different from what we have. I mean, there might be some shifts on the building location, but nothing at all dramatic. The area and bulk requirements, again, restrict us on that. Um, and um, and the other site, one of the other site requirements is quite a few of them, and I'm not going to go over them with in any great detail. But we try to make it as restrictive as we can, in in conformance with, with this proposal. So you know, if somebody, I know sometimes we we hear about uh, um, what could happen. This zoning pretty much will eliminate anything from happening other than what we're. Uh, presenting to you in this application. Only one and two bedroom units are permitted. Um, so you cannot have um, 
three or four bedroom more family. And I know that every town has a concern with the uh, cost from school children, which I know that, you know, this was when people, when towns were worrying about crowded schools, and most communities aren't worried about that anymore. But as basically, there'll be six one bedroom apartments. Is uh, Statistically, there's almost no children in that situation. And the two family apartments, um, two, the two bedroom apartments, uh, very few, usually, uh, um, statistically, it's about one per four apartments. So at the maximum or the average, we would say there's possibly seven school children from here. Um, the requirements uh, for affordable housing, again, that's pretty much um, part of the statute. And the application procedures, that is really, it, it, it requires a zone change, a site plan, and, um, as, as, and as part of an A30G application. Now, I've also been asked to, um, to do the housing affordability plan here. <coughs> And that had to be prepared in accordance with Section 830G. So the, you, if you look at different uh, ha, uh, affordability plans, they're, they're generally similar. Um, Chris went over the requirements of that. And, and the, um, the plan is, the affordability plan is basically uh, uh, the way to implement this. And because the regulations were put forward by the department, I guess the formerly Department of uh, Economic and Community Development, now the Department of Housing, I think, is, is the one that kind of administers it a bit. We put forward, we had to put that forward here and put, include it in the plan. And the, what you have here is in conformance with A30G, and I want to stress that. So, you know, there's some wording that we could change. Um, it obviously was tailored towards this proposal in the fact that uh, many proposals also include or may include a uh, for sale component. Because this one does not do that, it's, it's strict, uh, strictly uh, for uh, rental, we didn't deal with, uh, and, and the, uh, the pricing of, of the maximum affordable is, is subject to a um, series of factors, some of them quite variable. Um, and, and as you can see, we did discuss here that there's um, about the 15 percent, 30 percent, and uh, I didn't realize that this was going to be so far away, so um, I should have used bigger type here. But that's about the 15 percent for the 60 percent income level, and I'll come to that in a minute, and another 15 percent at the 80 percent. And the others just talk about that 10 percent threshold that, uh, that um, Chris just mentioned. Now, we took the income eligibility, the, the f it's based on what the median family income is both for the state of Connecticut, which is 104,000, and for the region, which in this case, Southington is part of the greater Hartford, the Hartford, East Hartford, or West Hartford metropolitan area, I think is the official um, reference. These are the me median incomes according to the state statistic statisticians <laughs> for a family of four in, in 2019, and it's updated annually. So what, what we start with is this would be um, for a family of four, that's the median income, 80% of that is 77,600, and 60% of that is 58,200. But they are actually have to be adjusted depending on the unit. And again, I'm sorry this isn't visible. It is in um, the plan that I put, I presented to you and it's on your, um, on your information. But I'll try to go through this and we don't have to worry about reading it. The, uh, this is one example. These examples are put in because is to illustrate the whole um, formulas essentially that, are, are, that have to be used. We start with the median family income, again, as I just discussed, is $97,000. The next, we have to adjust the income. For a, a, a two-bedroom apartment, they, 
the they assume and and the assumption is is fairly arbitrary I think that it will be a three three person family um, and so you adjust it down to ninety percent the again the median income is uh, ninety seven thousand but it's adjusted down for a smaller because the ninety seven is for a four uh, person family so we get down to eighty seven thousand three hundred. Then we take 80% um, of that item, again, to bring it down to the 80% of median income, and come down to 69,840. Now, um, the statute says that the maximum um, housing cost could be, should be monthly 30% of the family income. So 30% of 69,840 comes down to $20,952 as the maximum um, monthly average, uh, excuse me, annual monthly uh, average housing cost. The monthly cost then divided by 12 is $1,746 for this family of three in a two bedroom apartment. We also had to look at the fair market rent the fair market rent is used in the Section 8 uh, housing um, program, which uh, subsidize private housing. It's not used that much anymore, but again, it's embodied within this application as kind of a reference. And I know this, this is a, I, I, throwing a lot of numbers around here, but th this is determined by um, HUD, um, so it is what it is. And that's $1,310, but because it's for the 80%, we're allowed to up it by uh, 20%. And that comes to $1,572. The, ma the, the maximum cost, the maximum housing cost of this apartment for a, a two-bedroom apartment gear, um, set aside for, those, for somebody with a median income of 80% or less would be $1,572. Now, that, that's, that's a pretty healthy um, rent. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in some places, it's, it's above the market rate. There's also with the adjustments are th as, as far as... Um, tenant uh, paid costs. And that wasn't, to do that and finally at this point wasn't possible because we don't know how that's going to be structured. We assumed that electricity would be something the tenant paid. We didn't assume heat. If there, there are functions that the state publishes that will allow for a uh, two-bedroom, multifamily, you could uh, assume $58 an, a month for electricity. So you go back to their numbers if it's a little bit different. So what we've calculated on this is that for this two-bedroom apartment that, the, that there could be a maximum rent of $1,514. Now, every, the, the, the response I always get is, well, that's not affordable. That's high. I, I, I can't respond to that. It's done by a formula. It changes a bit. The uh, utility costs might change. The median incomes always change. They usually go up somewhat. So it, it's adjusted from year to year. But this is the formula that will be used over the whole 40-year life of this, um, of, of the time that these apartments are, are restricted. And just to give you an idea, here, here it is for the other, uh, for a one bedroom in the 60% range, the, it's getting maximum monthly housing costs, it's not necessarily rent, is at 1,091. For the two bedroom at 60%, it's 1,310. For the one bedroom at 80%, it's 1,276. And for the two bedroom uh, it's at um, 80%, it's 1,572, as I just calculated. Now. We might ask, who, who's going to live here, you know? Um, so we took those uh, income figures that I uh, in, uh, presented a few minutes ago, 
and we matched it. And, and of course, w the group that, you know, most salaries aren't really open, but the municipal salaries are. So we looked at um, the different uh, municipal groups to see how, how affordable it is. We started with teachers, okay? Um, and we got this information from the uh, uh, approved uh, labor uh, agreement. Uh, that uh, it's all it's all online here, and you could see that th that this in in the dark red, though those are the lower salaries, and um, the charts are, um, I guess the teachers get paid the pay is adjusted in steps I I believe annually, um, and where the B A is the middle column and the right column is those with a master's, so in the first. Two steps, both of them are actually eligible for a two-bedroom apartment at in the 60 percent, the lower level. Again, this is assuming that there's, you know, there could be two people and only one wage earner or whatever. The, um, the medium uh, color is for one-bedroom apartments at the 80 percent level, and the lighter color is for the 80% apartment, for two-bedroom apartment. So you could see even somebody with a master's degree on their eighth step still qualifies for an affordable unit. So we're not talking about, you know, people that are, you know, out of work. It's people that are, you know, somewhat supportive of the community. Um, the next one we looked at was the, uh, you know, police and fire. I'm happy to say the police, policemen are, and firefighters are paid better than the teachers. Well, I'm not happy to say it, but it, um, <clears throat> that there, but there's still a starting patrolman within, uh, and this is this fiscal year. It goes up next year uh, at 64,875, inc increasing to 69,510. They would qualify for the two bedroom at 80 percent. Similarly, the firefighters have quality for the two-bedroom at 80 percent at step one and step two. And then I took a look at the uh, most recent town budget. And these are all the um, positions in the town that are, these are at the 80 percent for a two-bedroom. And you can see there's an electrical inspector, mechanical inspector, some of the library, the library employees. And then we go down to the one bedroom and we get a whole slew of them. Again, no, I, I apologize, you can't read it, but it is in the report. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, executive assistants, truck drivers, community service assistants, secretaries, um, um, librarians, they're all in this. And then finally, at the two bedroom at 60%, you still have a bunch of people whose salary is below that uh, $58,000 level. So it is, there are people, that, and that's just on the municipal side, there's also other businesses in town that, that, rec that ha don't pay people the, the average of $97,000. So it, it, the need or the benefits for this are f could be fairly widespread. And finally, um, what type of characteristics? The, requirement that we put in the plan essentially is that they, they're identical, that where there's no differentiations between the units of affordable a market. So it's not like one will have a red door on it or anything. They, <coughs> that, that they've been, um, they're, they're, they're shown on the plan here and they're actually sprinkled through the, um, through the uh, uh, building. Um, there's two floor plans for the two bedroom units, one on the first floor, one on the second floor. The first floor is um, 1,060 square feet. The second floor is a little bit bigger because a staircase takes up some of the room in the um, first floor apartment. Um, and the, the first floor will have nine market three affordable. Second floor has eight market four affordable. The um, the one bedroom units, the first floor mar uh, apartments are 837 uh, square feet, two market, uh, one affordable, second floor apartment 867 uh, square feet. So you could see that it, it, it is really 
that they're not, they're not tiny apartments. They're market-size apartments. They're good-size apartments, and the two bedrooms are well over 1,000 square feet, and the one bedrooms are over 800 square feet. So with that, I'm going to, um, that's, that's the affordability plan, and I guess Steve's up now, right? Uh, again, for the record, Chris Smith, uh, one of the reasons we handled the rental rates is because, uh, and, and I've, I've done quite a few of these, I, I couldn't even tell you how many, and I have a few pending now, and quite a bit of uh, my work happens to be downstate, and um, citizens are very concerned about what workforce or affordability means with an 830G application, and um, some people think it's the Section 8 housing, and I think that we've just hopefully demonstrated to the commission and to the public this is not section 8 housing these are the uh, minimal numbers or the maximum rents uh, that can be uh, charged for people living here that would have to qualify for either the 60 or at the 80 percent median income so that's the purpose of that and I think Brian demonstrated very clearly uh, that many of your Board of Ed folks your teachers here in town and um, a lot of your municipal employees would qualify and it might not be as much of a problem here in Southington as in other towns, but very often, I mean, you have applications come in front of you and people talk about, you know, younger people moving in without kids because they're looking for a place to be or older people that might be scaling down. Those are the people that will qualify for these types of rents, uh, never mind the workforce people. That's why I like to refer to it as workforce housing. Second con uh, comment that I'd like to make is with the zone change because I think it's going to come up. Uh, I heard a little bit about that uh, with the prior application. Uh, we have created, as Brian indicated, a zone district uh, that really has been designed for this site development on this property. Uh, it is in, in, it's not spot zoning. I think our Connecticut Supreme Court in a case out of New Haven a few years ago uh, came down with uh, floating zones not being spot zoning. I, I, we don't have spot zoning. And again, this three-part application process just the way we've done it is what's used throughout the state I've used it I couldn't tell you maybe 30 times uh, over the past number of years since 830 G came into effect uh, through various towns in the state so it, it's not spot zoning it is going to create a new zone district and somebody may say well what happens somebody comes along you talked about the precedent and they want to use this zone district somewhere else to get the increased density well, the likelihood of that happening is almost zero. I've never used a town's. If you, no, I didn't. I thought it'd be different. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. We're, we're going to treat people with respect. Everybody should treat everybody with the same respect they want when they're sitting up at the podium. So, if the audience can please maintain some decorum, it's appreciated by the commission. I'm sure it's appreciated by the people standing up there, and I'm sure it will be appreciated by you when you're up there as well. So. Please refrain from the audience noise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the point being that if somebody wanted to use 830G somewhere else in town, they're going to develop their own zoning regulations that would work for whatever they want to do uh, with that property. So the precedent as far as this proposal going to be being utilized somewhere else, if somebody came to me and said, I'd like to do an 830G on some other site, whatever, wherever it is, I'd say design it uh, the way that you'd like to see it built, and then we'll draft regulations that make it work. And that's just what happened here. So I just wanted to, I mean, there's that fear. I've heard it everywhere. And um, there's a town downstate I have to deal with it on a regular basis, and we came up with a way to deal with it and where they've approved a number of them, a couple of them for me. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to make those two points with the rents and with the zone change relative to spot zoning, that concept, and I'll defer to your town attorney uh, in uh, going over that with you uh, maybe later if, it, if it's still a question, and relative to the precedent being used elsewhere. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And now I think we'll hear from uh, Steve Judas. I'd like to walk you through what I think most people want to hear about, and that <coughs> is the site proposal. Thank you, Chris. Steve, you know the routine. Name, serial number, all that stuff. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. For the record, my name is Stephen Judas. I'm a professional land surveyor licensed by the state of Connecticut, and I'm the owner of Harry Cole and Son. The office is located at 876 South Main Street in Plantsville. Um, my staff and I prepared the site plans 
and stormwater management report for this uh, for this site. Um, as as has been discussed, um, we have kind of an existing conditions plan that we've we've put up there. There's a series of maps that I've handed out that I'll go through. Some of them are just redundant; they're just different scales, so the commission can see uh, a better get a better handle of what's what's proposed. Um, the existing property, as you as you've already heard, is a 1.9 acre parcel. It's located uh, right now in an R12 zone. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, our area map. So I'm going to go to to this map here, which is our our existing condition uh, survey. I'll, um, historically, this property has been used for recreational purposes. There's a, a swimming pool and a pavilion on site and a parking lot. Uh, the majority of the site is uh, paved. Uh, this area here, there's some grass area. Uh, we have the pool area, uh, the pavilion here, um, and then we have some woodland around the perimeter to the, the south and the east of the property. Uh, the parcel has frontage on Liberty Street and West Center Street and is accessed by uh, two paved access strips in these two locations. The uh, property, uh, it butts residential properties basically all the way around to the north, south, east, and west. And most of these properties are multifamily uh, houses our structures. Uh, we do have some multifamily uh, developments. Uh, Renaissance Commons is this location. We have uh, Liberty Station to the north um, and some other ones that I think uh, we'll discuss a little further in the application. Our topography of this site generally slopes uh, to the north and to the east. Um, there's no um, drainage systems on site. The site basically drains uh, through sheet flow off site onto abutting properties and onto uh, Liberty Street and West Center Streets. Our proposed application um, for tonight, again, is a 30-unit, two-story multifamily residential building. The building will have, uh, I'm going to go back to, to this site right here. The building will have uh, sprinklers for fire suppression. It will have uh, decks to the rear or patios to the rear of each unit. Um, we have uh, the building heights and siding materials will be consistent with surrounding buildings, two-story building, approximately 30 to 32 uh, feet in height. And each unit will have a washer and dryer. Um, this is the elevation view. This is an L-shaped building. So this is the front and the L portion here is kind of coming forward uh, as you look at this side of the building. This is one of the rear views, and this is the side uh, over here uh, viewed from the, the north. And we have first floor plan and the second floor plan. Uh, this, the purpose of this is kind of identify the affordable units. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have this up for Brian's benefit when he was doing his presentation, but this gives you an idea of the first floor and how the uh, affordable units, uh, the blue units are the two bedroom units and the green units are the, the single bedroom units. And you can see on the first floor, they're uh, spread out among the f through the building in the same uh, situation on the second floor. As I get into the site, um, as you've heard tonight, we're proposing a new zone called the uh, Village Residential District. Um, and from a bulk standard or requirements, uh, this, this district will require 1.5 acres. We are their, our site has 1.9 acres, uh, so we meet that requirement. The minimum, minimum rear yards are required as 10 feet. Our proposal is for 20, 25 feet. Our minimum side yards are 10 feet. We're proposing 12.8. And the uh, minimum separation between buildings is proposed in that regulation is 20 feet. We only have one building, so we don't have to worry about that, re that requirement. Uh, maximum height is 35 feet. Our proposed building is approximately 33 feet, so it's under that 35-foot <coughs> threshold. And the maximum building coverage is 25%. Our proposed building coverage for this site is going to be 20.9%. Our minimum lot area uh, per unit is 2,000 square feet. Um, we come in above that at 2,583 square feet per unit. Um, as you can see, we have uh, parking areas designated throughout the site. Um, the parking areas, uh, we're required to have 59 parking spaces. So uh, we have six one-bedroom units at 1.75 uh, spaces per unit for 11 spaces, and 24 two-bedroom units at two spaces per, per or, I'm sorry, two spaces per unit at 48. Gives us a requirement of uh, 59, but we are proposing 65 parking spaces. Three of those parking spaces would be handicap accessible spaces up in the corner of the site in this location. Um, we've incorporated a planting schedule. Um, 
we've gone through and made some revisions to our schedule, uh, make sure we have uh, native plants. Our, our, um, we have red oaks and uh, red maples, silver lindens, and wild red cherries for our, uh, our trees. Our, our landscaping requirements, as you may know, um, requires, uh, I'm sorry, 20, uh, 20 square feet per space. So we're required to have 1,300 square feet of landscaped area, and we have 1,379 square feet. Um, your landscape requirements also require um, one tree for every, ten, for every 10 spaces. That requires seven shade trees, and we are proposing seven shade trees on the property. Um, the site will be serviced by public water and public sewer. We're connecting to the water and sewer at this location. On Liberty Street, we have a main that comes up through the site and connects to the building for the sewer and water. We're also proposing a hydrant on the property at this location um, for uh, safety purposes. Uh, emergency access is provided through the main driveway and we have another paved driveway to the north uh, for, for emergency purposes. The um, stormwater management system is a series of catch basins and yard drains. We have yard drains around the perimeter of the building. We have catch basins in the parking lot. Um, these will drain to a depression at the center of the parking lot, very similar to what we have here at the Municipal Center. If you ever park around the tree, you'll see that grass depression area. That area will be utilized to collect stormwater. Um, we also have stone infiltration trenches around the perimeter of the parking here. And we have a detention area with a curtain drain located this with an outlet control that will uh, reduce the flows out to the stormwater collection system uh, in uh, West Center Street. Now, the proposed system meets or exceeds the town of Southington's requirements, it provides a zero increase in peak runoff up to a 100-year storm event, and our system also incorporates uh, low-impact design features uh, to address stormwater quality uh, management. Our plans incorporate a fenced dumpster pad at this location, concrete pad that will be uh, screened and fenced. Um, we're proposing a site lighting for the parking area with full cutoff fixtures uh, with no spillage over the property lines. And our applicant will be incorporating bike racks and benches uh, in some of the islands for uh, recreational purposes. As part of our application, we've incorporated a detailed surrender, I'm sorry, a detailed erosion sedimentation control uh, plan with details and a narrative uh, to address any possible erosion materials during construction. And um, I think that pretty much covers covers the site. Um, I think, and you know, we've uh, we've met with staff. We've got some comments, and we're working on those. And um, we'll open it up to the next person, I guess. Thank you. Good evening. For the record, my name is Scott Hesketh. I am a licensed engineer in the state of Connecticut, the firm of F.A. Hesketh & Associates. Our office is in East Granby, Connecticut, and I'm the author of the uh, Traffic Impact Report dated November 15, 2019, which is part of this application. We were asked to take a look at the potential traffic impacts of the proposed development, and uh, our report presents those findings. As you've heard, the site is located uh, on Liberty Street between West Center Street and Eden Avenue. Uh, Liberty Street uh, is a town roadway which provides 35 feet of pavement, a single travel lane in each direction separated by a double yellow center line. Parking uh, is allowed on both sides of um, Liberty Street in this section of the, of the roadway. The roadway is posted at 25 miles per hour and uses along the roadway are mainly residential, south of Columbus, and a mix of residential and commercial properties uh, north of uh, uh, West Center Street and Columbus Avenue. The intersection of Liberty Street and Eden Avenue is a T intersection with stop sign control and the Liberty Street approach. And the intersection of Liberty Street and West Center Street and Columbus Avenue is an all-way stop sign controlled intersection. We looked at the files of the Connecticut Department of Transportation to see if there's uh, traffic volume data uh, for the area. Uh, the closest street where data was provided was Columbus Avenue. According to the Connecticut Department of Transportation counts conducted during May of 2016, Columbus Avenue has an average daily traffic volume of 5,400 vehicles, the morning peak hour of 313 vehicles, an afternoon peak hour of 495 vehicles. 
our office uh, arranged to have manual turning movement counts conducted at uh, the two intersections uh, previously mentioned during uh, the month of April 2019. Those counts were conducted during the morning and afternoon uh, peak periods. A review of the CONDOT data indicated that traffic volumes on Route 10 um, near Columbus Avenue have decreased approximately 19% between the years 2006 and 2015. Uh, therefore, we've projected the site, tr the observed traffic volumes here to a 2020 design year where we anticipate being open and in operation if this commission so, so grants approval. However, since traffic volumes have decreased in recent years, no growth rate was applied to the data, so the observed volumes were used as the background traffic volumes. You've heard the site plan described to you. It's approximately 16,400 square foot building, provides 30 uh, rental apartment units. 65 parking spaces. The proposed site access is uh, a, a driveway to Liberty Street. The driveway provides 20 feet of pavement, which operates under stop sign control, and there is an adjacent uh, concrete walk adjacent to that driveway. In terms of the trip generation of the proposed development, we researched the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation report. It's a standard engineering reference which allows engineers and planners to estimate traffic volumes at proposed facilities based on traffic volume counts conducted at existing facilities throughout the country. Included within that report are several land uses which could be applicable to the proposed site. There's land use code 210, which is single family uh, detached housing, land use code 220, apartment units, and land use code 230, condominiums or townhouse units. We ran the trip generation for all three land uses, and we chose the land use which presented the highest trip generation potential of the three land uses for analysis here, which happens to be the single family detached housing units. Based on that methodology, we're projecting the site to generate approximately 286 trips on a daily basis, a morning peak hour of 23 trips, made up of six entering and 17 exiting movements, and an afternoon peak hour of 31 trips, made up of 20 entering and 11 exiting movements. Based on the observed traffic volumes on Liberty Street during our manual counts, we distributed the traffic to the local roadway network with a distribution of 70% to the north and 30% to the south during the morning <coughs> peak hours, and a directional distribution of 50% in each direction during the afternoon peak hours. Again, this was the observed distributions during our manual counts. Capacity analysis calculations were conducted at the, at the two intersections previously mentioned, as well as for the intersection of Liberty Street and the proposed site access. The analysis indicates that under both the background and combined traffic volume conditions during both peak hours, that all movements operate at a level of service A or B during peak hours with minimal delays. We review the proposed site driveway location. Again, as stated, the site driveway intersects to Liberty Street at a point approximately 240 feet south of the West Center Street Columbus uh, Avenue intersection. Again, the driveway provides 24 feet of pavement, uh, sorry, 20 feet of pavement with a single lane in each direction. The intersection site distances at that location were observed to be in excess of 280 feet, uh, more than appropriate for an approach speed of 25 miles per hour. <clears throat> in addition, uh, uh, turning templates were reviewed um, to make sure that uh, the site could be serviced by an SU-30 vehicle, a delivery vehicle, or uh, a fire truck. The uh, turning templates for the, uh, were obtained from the fire department, and I believe we can demonstrate that the, uh, that the emergency apparatus can enter and exit the site um, even when vehicles are parked along Liberty Street in the, in the vicinity of the site driveway. So based on the observed traffic volumes, the existing roadway conditions, the projected volumes and levels of service, uh, it's my professional opinion that the streets providing access to the proposed use have adequate width, grade, alignment, and visibility, and have adequate capacity to accommodate the traffic volumes from the proposed use. In addition, it's further my opinion Oh, I lost my last sheet. 
It's further my opinion that the proposed development will not uh, negatively impact the, the safety of the, of the traveling public as a result of the traffic volumes to be generated. At this point in time, did you change the order on us? Okay. <laughs> At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Joseph Ersteg for uh, a review of the uh, safety applications. Good evening. My name is Joe Versteeg. I'm a principal in Versteeg Associates based in Torrington, Connecticut. Uh, I was hired uh, by the applicant uh, to review the building code and fire safety code and fire prevention code implications of this project. The concerns that you would normally have for the building are going to be covered by the Connecticut State Building Code which will be developed at a later time. As many of you may know that uh, the architect develops construction documents that will detail down to not only the, what the building is made out of but the seismic requirements and the wind load requirements all the way down to how many toilets, how much water comes out of a faucet to what are the regulations for the carpet within the building. So that is, a, that is done during the building permit application process. That review is required to be done by the building code, a building official and fire marshal in your community and once they're satisfied that the regulations have been met, been met, they issue a building code, a building permit, and then they conduct as many on-site inspections as they need to. There's some very specific inspections that need to be done. And once they're satisfied, they issue a certificate of occupancy for the property. As a follow-up to that, the fire marshal has the requirement under the fire safety code to do yearly compliance inspections of the property to look for safety items such as is the sprinkler system being maintained, are fire doors being maintained, or alterations being made to the building contrary to the plans. <clears throat> the sprinkler systems and fire alarms that are required by this, uh, for this project are required to be evaluated and tested and maintained on a yearly basis by Connecticut licensed contractors and those reports submitted to the fire marshal. In fact, at any point in time, one of these systems is turned off for more than four hours in any 24-hour period. The fire department and the fire marshal has to be notified by phone and in writing. And then emergency plans go into effect as far as how long this impairment is going to be. Is there an alternate we can do? Fire watch? Do we need to evacuate the building? So the state of Connecticut, through the adoption of the Connecticut State Building Code, the Connecticut Fire Safety Code, and the Connecticut Fire Prevention Code, which are enforced by your a municipal fire marshal and building official with assistance from the state building official and state fire marshal should the locals request it, governs every aspect of this building to ensure for the health, welfare, and safety of the residents of the building during the normal occupancy of the building, such as sanitation and, and, uh, and, and environmental air and so forth, as well as in conjunction with the fire code to not only provide for the health, welfare, and safety of the residents, but also resp emergency responders during emergency conditions as well. At this point in the project, you've seen an overview of the schematics of the building, watercoloring, rendering, if you will, and that's typical of what you see at this phase. And it gives you, the, the commission and the public, sort of a snapshot of what this thing will look like. Um, everything you've seen so far, the height, the type of materials, the construction, the size, area of the building, uh, the safeguards that are important to you at this point, the sprinklers and so forth, are all within parameters of the Connecticut State Building Code and Connecticut Fire Safety Code. More importantly, at this point in time, the primary concern is, can the fire department effectively fight a fire in this building should one occur? The Fire Prevention Code under the jurisdiction of the fire marshal has some very specific mandates as far as being able to get a fire truck off the main road and into the site. So there are very specific static requirements for the width of the road, the fact that the fire truck can't drive in more than 150 feet without being able to turn around. And in this example, as you come in the entrance road, you can do a complete drive around of the parking lot and drive back out. So we're not stuck with dead ends where we have to back a truck up or try and do what we call a K point, like a three point turn of the truck. This provides easy access in and around. So there's very specific requirements in the code that have to be met, and those have been met. In addition, the thing that is active is the turning radii of the truck. Can the truck actually make the turn? So as you heard testimony prior, 
we go to the fire department and we get your most demanding fire truck. What's your biggest truck that has the longest wheelbase that is going to be the most difficult to accommodate on making turns? And from the manufacturer of the truck, if the fire department doesn't have it, they give you the width of the truck, the length of the truck, the wheelbases, the inside turning radius, the outside turning radius. If you've ever driven in the snow, you know that when you make a turn and you look, the front and rear wheels don't track each other. There's always the front wheels, there's always the back wheels, then there's an overhang on the front. And all of that has been plugged into the computer, the AutoCAD computer, and put on this and it documents that the largest, the most demanding fire truck that was provided us can actually enter the site, make all of the turns, and actually completely turn around and leave the building and leave the site. So getting the fire truck in has been satisfied. The other requirement that's important is that you be able to get a fire truck within 50 feet of an exterior door of the building. This prevents you from pulling into parking lots and having to walk a mile into the building. In this case, the fire truck is within 30 feet of any front door. The other requirement is, do we have access around the other sides of the building? The two short ends and the two long ends on the, on the L-shaped. And those are allowed to have firefighters walk along a path to reach the back portions of the building. It's not required that you drive completely around the building. You only need to get to the truck to the front part of the building within 50 feet of any particular exterior door and then firefighters walk around the building. The ground is substantially level all the way around to affect ground ladder access to windows should that be needed. Um, but I think what's most important here is to, is to understand the effectiveness of a sprinkler system within the building. In 97% of the cases, a sprinkler, one sprinkler will put the fire out. In the remaining three, two to three sprinklers put it out. In a residential sprinkler fire, once the sprinklers activate, it's a warm, snotty, uncomfortable environment. It is not deadly. But should there be a concern, the sprinkler system is there, the fire department has access, the building is constructed in such a way to compartmentalize the fire so it doesn't spread beyond the apartment, and the building is constructed with <coughs> compartments between floors. In my opinion, looking at this and having done this since the early 1980s when I was with the State Fire Marshal's office, and since 1996, when I first became an independent code consultant, doing this all over the world, I will tell you that this project presents no adverse impact to the public safety or the residents. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I was asked to provide a little bit more of my resume rather than I'm an independent consultant from Torrington, Connecticut, which probably is a value because uh, Attorney Smith uh, says he has not submitted my resume to you. Um, I, in a former life, I was the Chief of Technical Services for the uh, Connecticut Office of the State Fire Marshal. Uh, as such, in the early days, I was in charge of the Fire Safety Code Unit and the State Building Inspector reported to me, State Elevators, Cranes and Demos, uh, and the Boiler Unit. We were the unit that promulgated and determined what was going to be in the building code, what was going to be in the fire code. So when I say that you have Connecticut regulations that are promulgated by the state of Connecticut, it's not the legislature that develops those. It's the individual agencies like DEEP uh, or DOT, in our case the state fire marshal and state building official, actually write those regulations. We decide based on public input what's valuable for the state of Connecticut, what's critical for the state of Connecticut input from the local fire marshals, local building officials, fire chiefs, etc. These regulations are then culminated into a document and submitted to the legislature for adoption and, and issuance as a regulation. I am a licensed Connecticut, the state of, uh, licensed building official in the state of Connecticut, certified fire marshal in the state of Connecticut, and a certified fire prevention, fire protection specialist through the National Fire Protection Association. Um, I serve on a number of building committees and fire code committees for the National Fire Protection Association as well as the, the International um, uh, Code Council. I've served on the International Building Code Committee. I served on the, the NFPA Building Code Technical Committee that writes the regulations for building codes. I serve on the, and have since 1985, uh, been a member of the um, 
the NFPA 101, which serves as the foundation for the Connecticut Fire Safety Code, the Committee on Residential Occupancies, as well as egress, and I've chaired most of those standards, if not once, twice over the course of my membership on that committee. sure that that was in the record uh, for the Commission and have that explained to you and um, if time permits then I'll, I'll submit a, um, a copy of uh, Mr. Versteeg's resume into the record later thank you I think we're gonna hear from Mr. Miller who's gonna walk you through the planning analysis and that'll uh, complete our presentation to the Commission this evening thank you thanks Chris <coughs> again uh, Brian Miller planning consultant uh, principal tournament group New England in addition to the uh, affordability factors that I uh, discussed uh, uh, a little while ago, um, I was asked to also do a, a, a planning analysis to look at the impacts, potential impacts of this. Um, and looking at it really just as um, 30 apartments at this location. Um, analyze the impact and, and, and look at all the uh, land use factors um, that are relevant to this particular property. Um, the property itself is a uh, rather unique property, I think, as we all know. It's, um, it, it basically has three little fingers of frontage, and it was kind of used, as I understand it, in, in the history as sort of a a private recreational area um, for um, some of the neighbors who I guess were at some point related. Um, it's unique in the fact that it's it's in the back. You can't see it from the front. It's it just abuts people's backyards, and 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 so that kind of calls for a different type of use. Uh, single family uses back there. I think maybe you could put three or something really are not practical. Um, the other, um, and, and I guess to, to kind of state the conclusion first, um, my analysis shows that this is, is really um, a beneficial use, whether it was affordable or not, whether it was, it's a ben proposed use is beneficial to the, the town. Um, I looked at, first I look at your uh, plan of conservation and development, and it had a couple of sections that I thought were relevant. Um, in, in chapter 11, it says the location of such housing um, should be guided so that it contributes to making a strong community. And then there were four things under, or uh, four relevant things <coughs> under that. One, one of them, the one in red, areas in or near downtown Southington and Plantsville where a higher density of housing can be accommodated and will support these community centers. This is a, an area which um, <coughs> um, for multifamily housing. Areas served by public water and sewer. Areas adequately served by roadway systems, which you've heard testimony uh, on those two items. And interestingly, areas where pedestrian connections can be made to downtown Southington and Plantsville and other community amenities. And, and I think that's real important, and I'll go through that in, in a few moments. Um, <coughs> the uh, plan of conservation and development also had several policies and s strategies. Policy, one of the strategy to guide multifamily de uh, development is uh, guide multifamily development to locations where it meets such criteria listed in the POCD, okay. And another strategy is continue to strengthen downtown um, and the policies there uh, continue the economic improvement of downtown by encouraging existing users to invest and promote revitalization. And most importantly, encourage infill <coughs> development compatible, compatible with, exist, with the existing scale architecture style and historic heritage. Now, if, uh, th this, this property is a, a, a textbook infill development, obviously, because the, the homes that are around it are much older. I mean, this pattern has existed probably for the, at least from the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Um, 
and some of the houses are older, some of them aren't quite as old. But this pattern of development has been long established. So and it, again, it, it's interesting that it faces backyards. Um, it also says that the, the determination of, um, well, <clears throat> when, I, when I do any sort of planning study, let me back up a second. I, I look at, I list the planning factors that influence are both positive and negative. For example, if it's a, a, a piece of commercial, a potential commercial development, and it's not quite on in a commercial area, you know, that would be an <coughs> impact is that it, it or um, that it's too far from a main road to, to be economical. But these land use factors um, have been analyzed uh, um, based on land use, community, environmental, and economic factors. Because one thing is it's nice to say we should have this land vacant because it's always been vacant or it's a nice wooded area or whatever. But in fact, that the, that the economic viability of any use is what guides the formation of a community. If it's not economically viable at certain points in time, it's not going to happen. So you can't just, you know, I, I, I was a town planner. In fact, I was a town planner in Berlin for a number of years. <coughs> And, you know, you go to the hearing and somebody's going to build a subdivision out in the woods. And you've all heard this. And, you know, people say, well, I like to walk my dog there and all that stuff. Well, that doesn't matter. It has to be, have some sort of economic viability. And that's to benefit not only the property owner, because we live in a capitalistic society, but also how it influences the community. Um, so some of the factors we look at as the environmental factors, as Steve uh, testified, you know, most of the site, in fact, is, is paved. It's all leveled out. There's no wetlands. There's no floodplains. There's no unique habitat for any species. It's basically, it can be developed without any adverse environmental impact. Um, the height of the buildings, you know, sometimes... Um, Multifamily buildings are, are kind of high and out of scale. A as you heard, maximum height is the same maximum height as in any of the single family zones. So we're not talking about anything high. You saw the renderings. It's, it, as far as the height and bulk, it could be a bunch of single family homes that would have the same visual impact. Um, as this proposal here. Um, one interesting thing is, is the linear trail. And, and I actually lived 25 years in Cheshire near when the first, uh, where our part of linear trail was started in the south side of town. And I've become a real fan of linear trails. And I appreciate the importance it has as a, as a real asset here in, in, in Southington. Well, the Linear Trail goes right by this site. It, it intersects the corner of um, West Santa Street and Bristol Street. So it's within a, a short block away. Um, the support for the downtown area and downtown revitalization I'll talk about in a moment. Potential impact on public facilities and services. Again, um, there does, there's no problem. There's not going to be any, any situations where the uh, sewer or or storm water it creates an adverse um, situation. As I've stated before, um, uh, maybe seven children, school-aged children, could be expected to live there, which would have um, no adverse impact upon your school system. And it, it also, I think, it, it, you talk about diversity of housing. And we're not, not, not talking about the affordable component necessarily. One thing that you know, we've experienced in Connecticut, uh, unfortunately, is, is a lack of job creation. And so that uh, we have, one of the problems we have is that our, uh, I'm, I'm a, as you could see, I'm old enough, I have adult children. And um, many of my friends, the adult children, um, didn't want to stay in Connecticut. There was no place wasn't affordable, uh, 
There was no place that they found interesting to live in. I had one end up in New York City, which I'm fortunate. My friend had somebody and his, one of his kids end up in Austin. You know, so you, you have that. We have an exodus in this state of young working people, which is really the essence of our future economy. This proposed development would provide a place for some uh, young adults who aren't ready to buy a house. It also has the advantage of being near an area where it's a little bit interesting. It's not off in the middle of a uh, single family subdivision. It's a, a block or two walking on, onto Columbus Street and you do and and I I've been in Connecticut thirty Mr. over thirty years and I remember going Mr. down. Mr. Miller, to, can I can I just interrupt you for a second, yeah. please? Is that we're we're about two hours into this meeting. I'll, I'll, I'll we have a, give, we have give a number of people phone. in the audience. If I could just finish, we have a number of people in the audience who I'm sure would okay. like to have an opportunity. And I, and you you all have been talking for about an hour now. So I just I just want you to, to try give to me, give me try five to minutes. consolidate and be a little bit more concise towards your presentation, I will. please. So, and I Thank apologize you. for that. I, uh, when I looked at the density, we looked at um, the density of different areas. And um, the proposed uh, development would have a, a density of about 15 units per acre. Now, we looked at the surrounding, um, like I'm not focusing here, but the, uh, well, what, whatever. Oh, there we go. Okay. At, at these surround, areas surrounding. And um, those areas on the north side, uh, as you can see by that chart, they have um, I, it's existing densities. The uh, areas on the north side, one part of it, uh, near the corner of Liberty and West Center, uh, there is a multifamily. They have over 16 units per acre. All the areas on the north side have very comparable. The, the densities on Eden Street are, are lower, of course, because there's mostly two family homes there. But the new developments in the area, Liberty Station, Renaissance, Commons, and, and Beecher Hill, all have density. Well, Liberty Station has 26 units per acre. Um, Renaissance Commons has about 11, and Beecher Hill has 12 and a half. So the density is really comparable. Um, the, um, one of the, the important factor here is it's an, it's an important component to the revitalization of Southington. You have, it's a short walk to downtown. In order to revitalize the downtown, you need people. People on the street, people with, with, uh, um, with a disposable income. This site is ideal for that. You'll have the younger people. The rents are not going to be that in inexpensive, so they will attract people with disposable income. And finally, the conclusions are that this is it conforms to the plan of conservation and development, no negative environmental impacts. You're creating investment in, in the core of the town, and that's really the, an important component of any community's center area revitalization. If you don't have investment or you discourage investment, your downtown is not going to thrive. No burden or stress, and, and my conclusion is that I think this would be a very beneficial, in my professional opinion, it would be a very beneficial component of, uh, of the revitalization of downtown Southington. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty seconds or less. I was just going to say that concluded <laughs> our uh, our presentation, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to responding to any questions that the commission, professional staff, or the public may have. And on behalf of the entire team, would like to thank you for your indulgence in letting us get through our presentation. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate that, to, uh, Chris, and and I think that in the interest of uh, of people's physical um, well-being, we might have a, about a five-minute break to, to utilize the facilities. When we come back, what we'll do is we'll open it up to commission members, which I'll ask them to sort of um, try to be concise in their questions to the applicant, and then we'll open up to the public to come in and testify in front of us as well. So five minutes. Um, I got 908. Let's call it at 911. We'll come back.
two people around here for like the I mean, yeah. unless there's case laws, I don't know. If we could just come back to order here. Um, all right. Did I do it again? Again? There you go. For robotics. <laughs> If we could just take any conversations out in the hall, please, so that we can move forward here. It's a little bit after 9 o'clock. I mean, if this development is going to critically damage that life. I'll give you a little history while I'm waiting for you all to quiet down, is that I worked in the uh, General Assembly, and Jody Rell at one point presided over the Senate. And if you ever sat in the Senate when Jody Rell was presiding, she had this look that she gave you. Which, which I don't want to replicate, but it was one where you knew that she was looking at you and you needed to, to tend to business somewhere else outside of where we are. Um, so we'll call the public hearing back to order. Um, there, I'm sure there's a number of questions for the applicant from commission members, um, or maybe there's not. But before we get to that, I just want to, uh, to toss it to Rob with the question of are there any outstanding um, issues or are we waiting for any town um, commissions or departments to get back to us on this application? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> we are still awaiting a response from the uh, fire marshal's office on the, uh, the, the uh, plan showing the turning movements, the, the exiting and entrancing or entrance turning movements. We're waiting a, a re response from them. We're also re waiting a response from the water department. I believe the, wa the board of water commissioners does meet on Thursday, and I believe uh, we're looking for some response after that. We do have a response to planning comments that went out uh, that the applicant submitted, although I believe that the plans need, still need to be revised. I know the engineering comments are still out, and they're, they're, we're expecting a response to those as well, and the applicant's probably waiting for both of those in order to, uh, to change the site plan accordingly uh, as necessary. Uh, those are the outstanding items that we have at this point in time. Okay. Thank, thank you, Robin. And just for informational purposes to commission members as well as to the public that's sitting out there, um, what, what that means is that this public hearing will not be closed at the end of this meeting this evening and is going to be continued um, to the next meeting, which is on January 21st, same building, same time. Um, we, we will take public comment in, in just a second. Um, but I want you all to know that, that if you don't get the chance to talk tonight, you certainly have that opportunity on the 21st, or if you want to wait until the 21st, that's, that's going to be available to you as well. Having said that, Attorney Taylor and I had had a conversation, and, and um, we have asked him to look into the issue of spot zoning just to get us some information on that. So that's another thing that I want to make sure that the commission members have um, the benefit of having before we render any decision that we might render up here. Um, with that, I'll open up the, the, uh, the floor to commission members for any questions that they might have of the applicant. Does anyone have any questions? I see none. So why don't we open it up to those who are in support of this application. If you can come up and um, come to the podium, state your name and your address. Um, anyone in support of this application would like to address the commission at this time? Going twice. I see none, so let's open it up to those who are opposed to this application. Um, anyone who is opposed to this application who would like to submit testimony to the commission, please come up to the podium at this time, state your name and address. In the interest of trying to move it along, um, if there's other people after this first brave gentleman, um, could you just form a line so that we can uh, move you in and out? And with that, if you could state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Mario Izzo. I live at uh, 44 Pebble Drive, Southington. I've uh, been in Southington since 1972. Um, my brother and I own the property at 2527 Bristol Street. We're fourth generation owners of this property. Uh, although we do not currently live there, the property does have sentimental value to us and we treat it like it's our own personal residence. <coughs> if you drive by, you know it is kept up very well. We have great tenants, and uh, we treat them like family. I'm speaking against this application for the following reasons. To request a zone change for a specific piece of property that sits in the backyard of over 20 existing properties with only a sliver of access to any roadway is absolutely unacceptable. Clearly, there was no consideration 
given to the rest of the existing neighborhood. This proposed development would not be in conformity with the rest of the neighborhood. We have heard from many of our neighbors who are against the proposal zone change and development and share similar concerns. Without adequate access for emergency vehicles, even though the professional here did state that there was uh, plenty of access, we really would like to see a fire truck make that turn with cars parked all over the place there. I just don't see that happening. The proposed construction of 30 units and 65 parking spaces on 1.9 acres of property, which is now designated as an R12 zone, again, not appropriate. How would the local school system be impacted? Yes, the gentleman said that they're one bedroom units, two bedroom. We all know that they can squeeze a lot of kids in those one and two bedroom apartments. What is the traffic impact to the surrounding streets? Again, I know there was a traffic study done. Some of the references were done four years ago before the development on Liberty Street. What happens if they develop the ideal forge property? I think we have to look forward to that as well. There is no provision for a recreation area. Where are these kids gonna play? We are concerned a development of this type would have a negative impact on the property values as well. If someone wants to develop the property, we don't object, but have them do it within the existing R12 zone. As I stated earlier, we've been associated with this property for many years. Our family had a very good relationship with the Gemadio family. In fact, we attended many functions at the Gemadio Grove, which is the subject property, on several occasions. Several years back, some of you may remember, the family was looking to develop the property and requested a zone change to high density. The circumstances were much different back then. The family owned several additional properties with access to Bristol Street <coughs> and Liberty Street that would have had incorporated into the development. They had at least three or four access points to Bristol Street, not one little sliver to Liberty Street. That zone change was denied back then for various reasons. Now the applicant is coming forward proposing more units with less space, extremely limited frontage, and one small driveway to access the property. Recently, my brother and I explored the idea of purchasing the land and incorporating it to our property. We were told that it would only that it would take most it would make most sense for us since we had the most frontage. We were told in order to develop the property, we'd have to incorporate our property and at best get up to six condo units. So now we're hearing that someone is looking to put 30 units in on 1.9 acres, having very little access and very little frontage. Finally, this application references the fact that Sullington needs more affordable housing. Not sure to what extent the per percentages referenced in the letter are accurate, but if they are, then let them put the units in a more appropriate location. There's plenty of property in town that would, would support this type of development. It doesn't belong in the backyard of 20 people. Um, I just, I had made some notes as far as the rents, and these are, I guess, more questions that maybe somebody can answer at some point. They make reference to the maximum rent. That's all fine and good, but if people don't rent at those levels, does that mean that they're eligible to drop these rentals down? And if they can rent them for eight, $900, does that attract a different clientele? Very possible. Once these units are up, who's gonna maintain them? We all know how that goes. You know, there's an ideal forge property that's, that would be an ideal location for something like this. Plenty of frontage, access to the railway that you know, everybody references. So again, there's plenty of other options. It doesn't belong in the backyard of these uh, 20 residents that exist. So uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, we hope you make the right decision and deny this application as it is presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rizzo, for coming. If you could just stay up there for one second, just so I can see if any commission members have any questions. Mr. Rizzo. Izzo. Izzo. Izzo, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, That's all right. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Mr. Izzo? None? Thank you very much for coming out.
Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Frank Izzo, and I live at 416 Rockwood Drive in Southington. As my brother mentioned, we own the property on 2527 Bristol Street. And I echo all the comments he made, and I am speaking against the application. I'll summarize some of uh, my major concerns, some of which my brother already mentioned, but I'm going to summarize them anyway. To request a zone change to a non-existing VRSD zone certainly sets a precedence, and I think the Commission is going to look into that. Um, in the backyard of the 20 existing properties that we talked about, with only one e egress and a one-lane emergency exit, I mean, that should certainly ha ha raise some concerns, which, by the way, is already uh, shared by existing owners and tenants. Changing the zone to allow the proposed construction of the 30 units and 65 parking spaces on the 1.98 acres of property in an existing R12 zone doesn't change the fact that this development doesn't belong in our neighborhood, period. The proposed development simply is not in harmony with the rest of the neighborhood. We talked about traffic, but I still think increased traffic in an already congested area, not to mention there's additional development housing development that's already in progress, which will also add to the traffic volume. I don't know if that's been taken into consideration. And the negative impact it'll have on, on the property values of the existing neighborhood. Many of our neighbors are against the proposed zone change, and they'll either speak against the proposal or I have a petition with a lot of their signatures, which I can share. In summary, this size and type of development doesn't belong in our neighborhood. I am sure there are many more appropriate locations for this, and even there, careful thoughts should go into where this zoning change and type of development belongs in Southington. On behalf of my brother and I, and all the neighbors against this development, we are asking you to deny this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Izzo. Just open any questions for Mr. Izzo from the commission members. Commissioner Coles. I just have one quick question, Mr. Izzo. Sure. Um, you can get close to the mic there. How's that? I can hear you. <laughs> when your brother mentioned that you had uh, tried to um, develop that space yourself, how long ago was that? And did, did you go any farther than just, um, just the, a theoretical uh, question about it, or was there any movement towards that? Mostly just an inquiry at that point. And just like we don't want to see this type of development in there, we would also take into consideration our neighbors and the type of neighborhood it's been. We want to keep it the way it is, and that's one of the factors why we didn't move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the, for the commission members? Let me, let me ask <coughs> Mr. Mark. Mr. Izzo, yeah, good evening. Good evening. Uh, you mentioned a petition with other people in the surrounding area. Do you have that? Would I, you I do have it. willing to submit it. bring it, Absolutely. submit it to us? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thank I you. Leave that here tonight, or sure, well, or you can yeah. deliver it to the planning office. And, okay. You know, as I I'll said, make, the, the, the public hearing is going to remain open, so we're we're okay. still going to take testimony okay. in about two weeks. So, okay. If you um, don't mind, I'll make a copy and then I'll deliver the original. Absolutely. Um, any other questions from the commission members? Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank have you a, for your have time. A, have a great night. Appreciate it. Anyone else to testify against this application? Good evening, uh, Commissioner and uh, Zoning commission Commissioners. I'm Joe Delaporta. I live in 99 Eden Avenue. Um, I grew up on Liberty Street. Uh, lived there most, most of my life. Uh, I have to say that uh, this application uh, is going to adversely affect the area. Uh, seeing that, I live... I still live in that area. Uh, I've seen many changes. Uh, one of the things today that I'm griping with is the um, traffic on Liberty Street. Uh, I know the uh, traffic study was done, but I'm sorry, but the uh, gentleman that did that doesn't live on that street, doesn't see the issues where uh, 
cars are parked on either side. You can't drive down the road. You have to stop on one side and let the other car go by. Uh, also, there was no mention of Eden Avenue traffic. There's cars there. Uh, traffic there is uh, very heavy, so there's going to be an impact in that area. From a, a standpoint of parking, I think that that's not adequate uh, in the, uh, because of other development areas. I see, uh, I've seen not enough parking. Uh, talking about two-bedroom apartments, and especially today, if you have working parents, kids going to school, everybody drives to school, you're going to need uh, more parking spaces. So th there's going to be a, in my, I believe that there's going to be an adverse effect. And I think that uh, the commission should also ch take a look at all of the uh, uh, regulations about parking. I, today is not the same as 30, 40 years ago. There's more cars on the road, more cars in apartments, and you need a lot more parking spaces uh, for you, for these families that live in, in, especially in a complex like this. So I am definitely not in favor of having this uh, development go through, and I'd, and I'm asking to deny the application. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Del Porta. Is there anyone on the commission who has any questions? Seeing none. Thank you for coming out tonight. Is there anyone else to testify in opposition to this application? <coughs> well, we have a moment, Mr. Chair. Just uh, we did. I did receive correspondence today from uh, Linda Holy in 112 Eden Avenue, who was also against it. Just for the record. Okay. Thank you. My name is Mary Parsons. My son owns a home on Eden Avenue. My family has owned several homes on Eden Avenue for over 70 years. This would be at 90 Eden Avenue. 90. Uh, I'd like you to know Eden Avenue is now called Eden Avenue Dragway. Whoever did the feasibility study for traffic is way off. We are inundated with traffic on Eden Avenue. The new apartments or condos on Fort Joan Drive, on Liberty Street, and now you want to put 30 families on less than two acres. It's, I thought it was a joke when I read the letter. I think you all know 30 families on less than two acres. I know the Gematios. I love the Gematios. They're good people. But that land wasn't, quote, residential. It, it was. It was used for parties and swimming, but it wasn't lived on. It was part of their back area where the family got together. That's not adequate for 30 units and for the traffic to come in and out of there. And of course, some will come on Eden Avenue and add to the speedway. It's very dangerous there now. We've had to call the police several times. You're adding a lot of congestion and when you say they can bring viability to the town, I love Southington, but what's uptown now? Restaurants and bars and a couple shops? We don't have Rayfields or Riccio's or shops any longer. There's no place to recreate if you put those apartments there. I don't know how it could fit into that area. That's the Gematio's backyard that you want to put 30 families in. 
and it affects Eden Avenue detrimentally. It's terrible. We can't afford to have any more traffic. You're squeezing everybody into that one area, and I, I hope you decide to decline this. I'm sorry I don't speak well. I have a dystrophy, but this really, really upsets me. After living in this town for a year, a uh, few years, <laughs> God bless everybody, and I hope you reject this. All the studies were very nice. If you could move them to another area. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. If if you could just uh, remain there, and, and I'll just say I think you did a great job um, for someone who claims that she doesn't speak very well. I think you did a great job, and we appreciate you coming out. Um, any commission members have any questions for Ms. Parsons? Can I just add uh, something? If just you could just state your name. Uh, your Jacob track. Parsons, 90 Eden Avenue. Um, I'm just stating that, just a clarification, that the traffic on Eden Avenue just moves so fast. It's a 25-mile-an-hour speed limit, but let's face it, people don't do 25 down that road. They probably do 40 because it's a nice straight strip, and adding more people to the area is only just going to create more of a hazard of people crossing the street and walking along the street and more traffic causing more of this and really... I've, it's been my feeling that that, that that intersection at Eden Avenue and Liberty Street should perhaps be a three-way stop sign, a three-way stop where traffic is a little bit more controlled, whereas mm -hmm. instead of just going flying free down Eden Avenue, because many is the time I've seen many accidents at that corner, and it's because of speed and people not being cautious. Mm -hmm. I'm just afraid one day a pedestrian's going to get hit and we're going to have an issue as far as that. And it's not meant for a high density. It's not. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? None? Thank you very much for coming out. I tried. <laughs> you did a great job, as I said. Uh, is there anyone else who's here to testify in opposition to this application? Just come forward, state your name and address, please. Um, yes, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is Margaret Elaine Anderson, and my residence is at 102 Cary Street, Southington, but I do own a piece of property, a rental property, at 32 West Center Street, which we have owned for many, many years. And I want to say I agree 100% with everything that's been said, and I appreciate the speakers who have expressed that. And what was just said just now about the danger of the traffic on Eden Avenue, and especially that corner right there at Liberty Street, I want to think about this for a moment. Now, of course, we don't know how many children may be living at this development. Um, but those children, school young children, up through grade, up through grade six, I guess, would. <laughs> sorry. Pardon. Oh, is it grade five at Darinowski? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So those children who would be living. Ms. Anderson, could you, could you just do us a favor? Just step back just yep, a little yeah. bit. All right. It, it, it gets recorded and it's, it's because on Because I was air, having so trouble, I just want to make so sure. I'm sorry. We're getting some feedback up here, so okay. I just want to make sure it comes clear. Okay. Is this any better? Okay. Tell me if it's better. Okay. Great. So now thinking about the traffic, how much traffic there is now on on uh, Eden and Liberty. Those children living here to get to school, to Derinowski, if I'm not mistaken, would have to walk down Liberty and cross Eden to get over to go to Derinowski. Am I correct on that? Am I right on that? No, there's no okay, way. Okay. There's, okay. Just, you're talking to us, 
So okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to be sure I was, I was clear on that because I am not down there when the kids are going to school. So I wasn't quite sure exactly. But uh, to me, that seems the logical way that they would go. So we just heard about how dangerous that area is with all that traffic. And when you add a lot of kids walking through there going to school, in my opinion, that is a nightmare. And if someone gets hurt or killed, you can imagine. And someone else oh, who was doing the traffic study on, who mentioned Route 10, that the traffic has decreased over the years on Route 10. Now, th I don't know uh, when that study was done or when that was measured, unless it was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. But I've lived in Southington for 50 years. And in that time, I have seen traffic increase everywhere in Southington, including Route 10. And many, many times when I'm down in the center of town on Main Street, just trying to go through town on Main Street, I feel like I'm in the middle of New York City. So I certainly can't imagine how traffic has decreased. And with this traffic added, I, I, I would be just, it would take forever just to get through town, just the traffic going through town. So those certain are considerations. Now, uh, I have a couple of questions, though, about this letter, which I've, and by the way, one more thing. I am so glad to hear you say that there will be other meetings about this, because when I received this letter, it was after Christmas, I think maybe the 27th, um, I was getting ready, I was going to be away from a week, for a week, I come back, so I only have a few days to try to digest this, and so hopefully by having other meetings, we can let other people in town, we can all let other people in town know about this, and one of the main considerations, I think, for other people who don't live or have property in the area right there, is that, as someone else has said, if this is changed, if this zone change is made, that's a precedent. You're setting a precedent, and I don't see why that couldn't happen to any neighborhood anywhere in the entire town. <coughs> so I don't think many people would be happy with that. Okay, now back to the letter. I have a couple of questions. I'm not sure who would answer that for me but um if you phrase your questions the applicant you, will come back right? up um, after everyone is done mm -hmm. and we'll ask him to address those questions oh so. good okay all righty well it's uh well the pages aren't numbered but it happens to be the fourth page and the title of it is planning and zoning department it's the form to be filled out now down at the bottom it asks for the signature of the petitioner. Now, I'm a retired school teacher, and I've read a lot, or tried to read over the years, a lot of illegible papers from students, but I cannot read that name, so I'd like to know who has signed this name right here. Also, underneath it, it says to print the name, and that has been left blank. So if you would, I know the builder, it does say the builder is Hunter, but um, I was just curious about that. Also, I'd like to know who will, once it's built, once Hunter has built this development, who will actually own and operate that facility? Who will manage it, who will own, who is the owner? Who's going to be collecting all of these huge rents that they're supposed to be getting um, seems like a very lucrative um, Section 8 um, money to me. And who, who is even uh, the owner of the property now? Who's selling the property? Okay, so just curious about that. And let's see, I had a couple of other things here. Um, Uh, let's see. Well, some of these have been <coughs> answered uh, right before I came up. Oh, yes, here's something else that is in the letter, and it has been referred to already. It says that um, 
Southington's percentage for Section 8 housing is 5.38%. So I went onto the website uh, for Department of Housing, Affordable Housing Appeals list, just to see, and sure enough, it is listed for that figure. But also on that list, it has 29 towns in the state of Connecticut as meeting the 10%. They have over 10% Section 8 housing. Uh, but there are 140 towns that uh, do not have 10%, which of course would include Southington. And on that list, 11 of those towns have less than 1% and 52 of those towns have less than 3%. So I just found that to be very interesting. Um, so some towns in the state have a lot less um, of Section 8 housing than we do. Um, so that's it for now, but I'm sure I'll have some more later on. Okay. So thank, thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. A anyone, any commission member have any questions of Ms. Anderson? I, I will say that the owner of the property is listed on the agenda. Um, the current owner of the property is Jamadio. Okay, that's what I thought, but it wasn't if sure. If you look at the land records, that, mm -hmm. that's also indicated. But to your other questions, we'll, we'll give the mm -hmm. applicant an opportunity to come up afterwards and answer those questions along with some of the other things that have been raised. So is there anyone else here to testify mm -hmm. in opposition to this application at this time? Well, I thank you, and I definitely oppose this, and I'm glad we're having another meeting sure. on the 21st, yes. correct? Thank, mm -hmm. thank, thank, thank you for coming out. We'll give it one more try. Anyone else here to testify in opposition to this application at this time? Well, let's, let's, let, let's let everyone else get an opportunity before you come back up, all right? Hi, my name is Roxanne Mirando. I reside and own 1820 West Center Street. Um, I agree with what Mario and Franco have stated, and I back what they say. I have one concern in regards to the property in the back. Um, to my knowledge, it was once owned and utilized by, sorry, I'm very nervous, Southington Oil. Um, I want to make sure that the land has been tested, it's not contaminated, and if it is contaminated, what will be done um, for the cleanup if this follows through? Um, and I will make no, I am against this. Um, and I think that's basically it right now. Any questions? Hearing none, thank you for coming out tonight. For not being a public speaker, you did a pretty good job. Is there anyone else here to testify in opposition to this application? Ms. Anderson, go at it one more time. One question. Yeah, I forgot sure, this go one. ahead. Just one more question. Okay, so uh, the Giamatos are the uh, owner. Um, and do they have a buyer, is it, or is it up for sale? Do we know who will be the owner? If it is sold? That, that, that's something I think you asked, and, and I'll ask the applicant to address that okay. um, when they All come right. up. Thank you. Is there anyone else to testify in opposition to this application at this time? I see none. So if we can get the applicant to come back up. I think there were a couple questions, and while you're on your way there, I'll just, I'll just frame the ones that I took note of. Um, <clears throat> there was a question about emergency vehicle access to the property. Um, which I think, Rob, if I'm not mistaken, is what one of the things we're, that's outstanding that we're waiting to get here back from the fire marshal on, right. if I'm correct. Correct. Um, the other thing that I that was raised by um, by uh, Mr. Izzo and I think Ms. Anderson may have spoken to this too is the maintenance of the units, and um, then there were a couple people who brought up traffic concerns. Um, so if you can, you could take some time to talk about those and then I'll get to a couple very specific questions that Ms. Anderson brought up, which you can, you can answer. I'll, I'll try my best, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Um, for Stitcher, the record, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. 
No, go ahead. I was going to say name and name, yes. please. So. For, the, for the record, uh, Chris Smith, on behalf of the um, contract purchaser uh, applicant, uh, my client, Hunter Build LLC, is my understanding is under contract to purchase the property. If they purchase the property, they will own it. Uh, they will construct what's being proposed with the site development proposal and they'll operate it. Uh, I think uh, we heard from a number of landlords uh, who rent. Uh, I presume that they're, they're taking care of, the Izzo's claim they're taking very good care of their property. I would assume that my client would take care of theirs, uh, especially if they want to have people renting from them. So, uh, and then under the affordability plan, as we've indicated, they will be administering it or they would have some, uh, somebody who does qualify to administer it. And that means with the affordability plan, there's various restrictions that if this were to be approved, that would apply to the deed restrictions, for example, and would monitor this. And uh, yearly reports have to be made to confirm that uh, the units are being rented to people who qualify at the 60 and at the 80 percent median income. And that has to be, uh, there's an annual report that's filed and it can be filed with whomever is designated, whether it's the commission, your professional staff, and or your housing authority if you have one. Uh, that's typically how that gets done. So there is a process for monitoring to ensure uh, that the, uh, the rents uh, are rented at those that, uh, as required under Section 8-30J. Uh, there was a question, what would stop somebody from renting any of these units at $600 uh, a month? And I suppose there's nothing, uh, but I, my understanding, the way that things generally work is that people try to maximize the rents uh, in a building uh, that they have. So I, and, and as we indicated, um, the market rate can be a little higher than what's uh, qualifying at the 80 percent, and, and then there's lower, the, the 60 percent is even lower. So I, I mean, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that, but the idea is to make money. And, um, and, and Mrs., um, excuse me, Ms. Anderson made reference to Section 8 housing. Uh, the Connecticut DOH's house, the 10% uh, list is not Section 8 housing. They, it may include some Section 8 housing. There's a whole list of different uh, uh, types of units, types, type of housing that do qualify and get counted. Uh, towards the 10 percent number of towns have applied for moratoriums throughout the state with the legislative changes uh, from last session uh, to accommodate some of the um, some of the uh, legislators in their towns that were uh, looking to modify and pull back on 830g for a number of years so there will be more towns qualifying uh, certainly are a number of towns that have less than five percent I've, I've done some where there's been as low as maybe seven deed restricted units in the entire town uh, that qualify uh, i think under one percent um, i've seen towns that are at nine percent and you can come in with an 830j uh, so i'm not sure what the relevance of that is um, i'm not sure who exactly signed the application form i don't know what, how it's relevant whether it was Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Rogers, Rusty Rogers signed the application for him on behalf of uh, Hunter Build LLC. I believe he's he's, certain, he's a member of that uh, LLC and is authorized to do that. Uh, who will own and operate? Who is the owner? Uh, the chair indicated that uh, Section 8 housing, uh, it's not. And uh, the contract purchaser, again, is my client. And that, that's how we have the quote unquote standing uh, to appear before you this evening. Uh, on behalf of, uh, with the authorization from the owners. I think I've responded to most of the questions. You, there, was a, there was a specific with traffic, um, and when the studies were done in, in Route 10, uh, actually decreasing within a certain time period, if I recall, maybe uh, Scott can specifically address that. I know he mentioned that in his, his summary. I think as Scott makes his way up there, just re with regards to the emergency vehicle access. It is something that we're waiting, as I said, from the fire marshal, the town fire marshal, to get back to us on. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to continue this public hearing so that we have the opportunity to receive that and to review it and consider it as part of the evidence. <coughs> Again, for the record, Scott Hesketh, the uh, traffic uh, consultant <coughs> for the applicant. Uh, the reference to the traffic on Route 10 was a comparison of the CONDOT traffic volume counts between 2015 and 2006, represented a decrease in traffic over that, uh, that period of time. 
The only reason um, to bring that, I'm sorry, that's the Connecticut Department of Transportation. They do periodic counts. Typically every three years they do a count on, on most state highways and some local roadways. Um, and between the years of 2006 and 2015, there was a, a decline in traffic volumes, the average daily traffic volumes on Route 10. The reason for bringing that up is because typically when we do a traffic report, we do traffic volume counts. We project out to a design year when the development's going to be completed. Our counts were conducted in 2019. We were projecting to a t to 2020 design year. And if we had noticed a growth in traffic on Route 10 from the state counts, we would have grown the traffic volumes that we observed in our manual counts up to, uh, you know, by whatever percentage that had been. Since we noticed a decline in traffic, we felt that it was appropriate not to use any growth rate uh, on the traffic volumes that, that, that we had counted. Uh, there were a number of comments uh, from people that traffic volumes are very heavy out here. Well, during our manual counts, we observed a total of 103 vehicles on Liberty Street during the morning peak hour, 138 in the afternoon peak hour. On Eden Street, the morning peak hour was 249. Uh, east of Liberty Street, 311 vehicles in the afternoon. And on Columbus, the traffic volumes east of Liberty were 304 in the morning, 489 in the afternoon. And those volumes compared to the DOT counts of 313 and 498, almost identical to the to the DOT counts which uh, are presented in table one in the report. So are those high traffic volumes? Uh, not in my opinion, especially Liberty Street, which the traffic volumes are two vehicles a minute on average during the peak hour. Um, are people speeding on Eden Avenue? They certainly can be. Uh, we're not proposing it, but we had no objection if the town decides as a traffic control measure or as a safety measure to uh, make the intersection of Liberty Street and Eden Avenue an always stop controlled intersection. That's certainly something that the town, uh, the town can do. We haven't made it uh, part of our proposal. Uh, I, we would probably accept it as a condition of approval should the commission decide that that's a, an acceptable thing to do to provide uh, uh, an increased measure of safety to the public. In terms of the um, students going to, to school down the street, um, we haven't had a chance to talk with the school board, but the school board website indicates that uh, students going to that school from Liberty Street are to be bused. That's not to say that they're not currently walking, but uh, it's my understanding that the policy of the school board is that students on Liberty Street are bused to the school. Um, again, I don't have any students that go to that school, so I can't, uh, I can't comment on that, but um, that is the school's policy as far as I understand it. So, so, Scott, you, you uh, the, the speed of the vehicles is not something that you would pick up as part of any traffic study that, that you typically would do. Is that correct? Well, uh, if we were proposing a driveway to Eden Street, we might have checked out the, uh, the, 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 the speeds of traffic in terms of sight distance uh, requirements. Uh, on, you know, we're on Liberty, and uh, it's a short section of roadway. We're within a couple hundred feet of the uh, intersection of Columbus. Uh, it's difficult to get going too fast on Liberty. Uh, it's a short section of roadway. Um, so the 280 foot sight distance that we've uh, indicated is the conduct requirement for the 25th, you know, 25th percentile speed. So we believe that, uh, that that's appropriate. Okay, and I think Commissioner Macchio has a, has a question. Oh yeah, um, <coughs> I find it hard to believe traffic on Route 10 has decreased in that <coughs> time period, having lived here for the last 20 years. What, what portion of Route 10 are you talking about? Route 10 runs a long way. Uh, are we talking about the center of town? Are we talking about the northernmost portion of the town by Plainville, southernmost down by Cheshire? Uh, I'd like to know that. Route 10 north of Route 120, which is just south of uh, Eden Avenue. Avenue. Yeah. Avenue. That's, that's quite a that's bit away from where we're talking about. That's that's the nearest. That's, that's the near. That's the well, it's, it's it's relatively close to Eden Avenue, uh, and it's uh, the the nearest count station that Condot has to the uh, proposed development, and it would be the most appropriate to to apply in this situation. Again, we did not reduce traffic volumes. I'm just recording, representing to you what is found in the Department of Transportation files. Uh, if if they've made an error, I I can't speak to that. And once again, it's it's five years old. Well, 2016 was the last count. 
So it's three years old. Their 2019 count has probably been done and will probably be published in the, in, okay. in, in the upcoming months. Uh, it may change, but. Okay, I, I just I, I disagree with the premise. I mean, having lived here along with many others, um, try and get a parking spot on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday downtown. Try and drive through town on a Friday or a Saturday. So, some of the studies I take with a grain of salt. That's that's all I'm saying. I I, I don't doubt your experience. I'm just mm -hmm. reporting to you what the Connecticut Department of Transportation right, has in their files. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Is it? Yes, Mr. Vallope, yes. Oh. Volpe. 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 <laughs> I always get it wrong. Hi. Um, so, yeah, we, we've heard a couple of interesting things this evening, and so far as um, cultural and environmental impacts of, of this proposed project area, I'm just wondering, I, I have the 2017 um, historic resource study, historic resource inventory report in front of me. It was deemed that Eden Avenue was eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places because of that 19th century vernacular archi architecture over there beautiful, um, which was there because there was a business, the Southington Cutlery Company, back in the day. So it was working housing, so let's just make that clear. Um, so I'm just wondering, when was the last time an environmental cultural review, like a phase 1A or something, has been done in this area? And can we see some of that possibly for our next meeting, if that's possible? Um, I'm, I'm mentioning that the Cove, uh, I don't know, far too young, obviously, uh, but it sounds like that was a cultural place for the community, which would be in conjunction with the National Register listing. I'm a historian and National Register specialist. Um, so I'm just a little concerned about that. And then also, to some concerns about oil. It sounds like there needs to be some sort of uh, environmental review done, a cultural review done in this space. What, has that been done? Have we looked into that? Well, uh, to the National Historic Registry? I'm just talking about Section 106 compliance with the National Register of Historic Places Act. Um, has there been any review of that particular land in accordance with some of the statements that have been made tonight and so far as the historic structures that are around there? You know, you're not that far from the Center Street Historic District either. It might, it might be feasible to do something like that if it hasn't yet been done. If it's th that I would respectfully submit is not an issue for an A30G application. It's not a substantial public interest. Under the statute, if this were zoned, if this were located in a historic district, would mm -hmm. the municipal have been under seven da or four dash, uh, seven dash, uh, whatever it is, two, 214, we would have to get a certificate of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a situation where when they learned that we were coming in with an A30G application, they placed the property in a historic district. Uh, that property has since been built on. Uh, since that was, I, the court did not look favorably upon that. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not aware, neither are you, of it being located in a National Historic District, and that's all I can report to you. It's not. It's, no, it's this area is not. Knowledge. It's not. But it was Property. termed in 2000, it was deemed to, in 2017 to, to be eligible for listing. Well, if so I'm just concerned about, ha since you have come to this project, has there been anything done to look into the feasibility based off of the cultural and environmental impacts of that area? Is, as to whether it would qualify for the national? I, I don't understand. I apologize. I'm, I don't understand the question. Commissioner Volpe, maybe sure. um, I could add to yeah, this. Yeah, reframe um, it. Yeah, no problem. Make um, it make sense. I'm curious, are, are, you, are you requesting or asking if, if, um, if the applicant can go before the State Historic Preservation Office for some kind of project review? Um, and, and, you know, since it isn't listed on the natural, it's eligible, but it's not listed on the no. National Historic so Register. Let, 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 let me just turn to Attorney Taylor and ask him if any of this is relevant to our um, consideration on this application. In looking at other towns, it has been relevant. Also, uh, you know. I wouldn't believe this has anything to do with the application here. It obviously doesn't benefit for uh, the applicant to look into whether it could be deemed a historical site or not, and I don't believe it is now, so I don't know why he would do that proactively, but... Um, if that's something that, you know, the town wanted to pursue, I think that's obviously something they can pursue to look into, whether that could be part of that. I don't know how that um, really works towards this applicant here, well, but obviously if that's so in the interest of the town to do something. So maybe I'm just which I am. I just, real quick, I, I don't think that there would be anything wrong in working cooperatively with the public and trying to see 
what the benefit would be of changing this area culturally for them. It sounds like many of the residents that came up here tonight have been there for a very long time, have an idea of what their town looks like. And, you know, with our plan of conservation and development, we do need to think about what that area is going to look like. Listen, I'm, I'm like the number one master's degree student going to law school who has a ton of debt and one child. I'm not against this. I just want to be sure that it's fitting with our plan of conservation and development. I want to ensure that we are putting the mind of the people into this place that has been a cultural place of significance for them for what seems like upwards of 40 years, which is significant. So over 50, that makes it significant. So again, old school historian, my bad, um, but just, just want to clear those things out there. I'm sure it doesn't really involve or came to the mind of this, but um, as you saw earlier, we do like to look at historic maps and things, so maybe we can see some of that. Just about, uh, good luck, but give you should give serious consideration about the law school thing if you want to do that. But <laughs> Take my LSATs on Saturday, for the record. But in all seriousness, good luck with that. And uh, with all due respect, I, I just we're going to respectfully decline. We're not going to be uh, looking into sure. uh, those particular issues. They're not relevant to an 830G application. Uh, the matter that I made reference to this other uh, Fairfield County town, same type of thing, 1920 housing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just not relevant to, uh, to this application. This is essentially a vacant piece of property. I know that people have used it. There's a pool and whatever on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it, there's no housing that qualified that is national designated any type of either uh, municipal historic or from a national perspective. Uh, and I'm just, from an 830G perspective, one of the things I was going to point out when Mr. Miller was done uh, with his references to the POCD, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's fair to say that 830G, whether an application complies with the POCD under 830G, it's not relevant whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, substantial public interest, the student impact, not relevant. I mean, you can look at the case law. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has to be a substantial public interest, and I just would respectfully submit, uh, and, I, and I get it. I, I understand what you're asking. Mm -hmm. My job is we filed under a certain statute. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, there's going to be rental restrictions so that we qual my clients qualify for the ability to apply for this. But by applying for this, it's a limited uh, thing. There's a number, a limited number of issues uh, that can serve as a basis for denying the application. And I would respectfully submit that that's not one of them. And um, I'm going to, unless my, I'm told otherwise, I would just respectfully we respectfully uh, recline that, decline that invite. <coughs> but thank you for asking. Okay. I, I want to add to um, Commissioner sure. Volpe. Commissioner um, Albanese, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Commissioner Volpe also mentioned the uh, Phase One ESA. So has um, any kind of uh, evaluation been done on any hazardous contamination or any kind of remediation that has been done historically? Because we are aware, some, well, someone brought it to our attention that there was the Southington Oil Company that utilize that site at one point. Yeah, I, I'm going to look into that with my client before the next meeting, but my understanding, my client's understanding is there isn't any environmental issue with it. And I, I can't imagine there's anything recorded on the title, right. you know, so the indicating anything. Right, it's the applicant's responsibility then to <coughs> come before us next meeting and, and give us some information on and that. And I would just respectfully say that uh, an applicant is not obligated uh, to provide that information to a commission, whether it's under an 830G application or not, unless there's some sort of known issue there. So I'm just, just stating that for the record. I, I will say this, though. Um, is it not true that, you know, our, our part in this is to see the, 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 the substantial public interests of health, safety, and other matters to which are not outlined? The other matters in this case of which I speak of is the cultural significance of that area. So I do believe, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, that is part of what we're speaking of here is that health, safety, and other matters. I just want to put that out there because that is within 830G. And there's a lot of litigation over that, and I'm just saying to you that I, and I've done a fair amount of that, and I'm not aware of that, uh, what you're suggesting as being a, uh, constituting uh, an, or other matters that may be considered as a substantial public interest under 830G, uh, any more than a number of other items that towns have used as a basis for denying. Again impacts on adjacent properties, uh, values, cultural, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, impacts in the school system, mm -hmm. not valid reasons for denying it. I totally see where you're coming from. But in 2015, when the Supreme Court decided that commissions like this one 
will be the ones to hear these appeals. It wasn't dissimilar for the reasons that I just mentioned. So I feel you, but I think there might be a reason to go for it, and I digress. Okay. Because now I'm ready. No, no, we're, this is important. This is good dialogue. It's very healthy, yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm good job. I'm good job. Ready. Any other questions from the commission? See, seeing none, I, I, I think that, as I stated earlier, that we're going to leave this public hearing open. Um, and we'll be back here, as I said, on January 21st, and, and uh, you'll be on the agenda then. I'll say to members of the public who came out tonight, first of all, you know, thank you for coming out. It's, it, I know it's not often that you probably get to see this kind of entertainment, but we're here every two weeks, so, so come on down, and, uh, and we're happy to have you here. Um, having said that, anything that was said tonight is a matter of record. Um, if you want to come down on the 21st and testify again, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, but there's no need, if you spoke tonight, to, to do so because what you said tonight will be considered as part of our, our deliberative process. Um, but again, I think we'll leave this, this uh, open for public hearing and we look forward to seeing um, the applicant and anyone else um, two weeks from now. Mr. Chairman, I'll be at 7 o'clock just for the record. 7 o'clock, uh, this same room um, on okay, the 21st. Thank yep. thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So I think we're ready to move into the business part of our meeting. <coughs> so item number 8A. We're leaving this. Public hearing is left open. Uh, item 8A, Mark Lovely proposed zone boundary change from I-2 to R-12, property located at 136 Curtis Street, parcel size plus or minus 21 acres, zone change number 562. This was tabled at our last meeting on December 3rd. Ready for action. The commission can discuss. Uh, you have your the evidence and the record to consider. Um, Again, I just state that the I've said, I've said it before. The plan of conservation and development does say to maintain and protect residential uses zones, but it also says to uh, retain your industrial and commercial corridor. So it's okay. uh, so it's your decision. So I guess to kick off the discussion, we should get a motion um, from somebody. You know, I used to sit where you all sat, and I used to look at our previous chairman, and I, he used to remind us that the chairman isn't somebody who makes motions, so I can't make a motion, um, but what's your pleasure? I mean, so, so I think we have a couple different options. One is to, um, is to approve the application as submitted. Um, one is to deny the application as submitted. And then there's variations in between there, some of those that were presented tonight. So. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we deny this application as submitted. So we have a motion on the table from Commissioner Salka to deny the application as submitted. Do we have a second? I will second. Second by Commissioner Macchio. So we'll open it up to discussion. So. You want since to go I first? made yeah, go ahead. since I made the motion, I guess I <clears throat> I'll open up the discussion. Um, as I stated at the previous meeting, Mr. Chairman, I'm I'm very concerned about giving up an I-2 zone. Um, I understand exactly where the neighbors are coming from. Um, <clears throat> with the additional information that we had this evening, um, with how far back this piece of property has gone, uh, b back into the the 60s, um, this property has pretty much been as it is today, going back to the 60s, even though with the zoning change, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and many of the neighbors, I'm sure, moved into that property after that period of time, knew what was there. Um, I don't think there's been a significant number of changes there, um, other than perhaps the road pattern um, on Curtis Street. But other than that, um, it's been pretty much as it is today. And I just, am reluctant to hmm. give up an I-2 zone at this point, um, maybe in the future, um, as we gather more information, as perhaps uh, Lou Perillo uh, comes forward and saying, there's nothing we can do with that on an I-2 zone. 
it's just too landlocked, whatever, the, whatever he might come back with. But I just hate to give up on an I-2 zone at this point um, in time. Thank you, Commissioner Salka. <laughs> any, any other commission members have? I, I'd like to add to it, Commissioner just said, um, I agree with uh, most, most all the statements that he has. Um, the one thing that has led me to not want to go forward with this is we, we talked about it tonight in other areas and it has to do with precedent. And again, once we turn this from one I-2 to an R, whatever, in this case an R-12, the precedent gets set. Now just north of this property is another industrial zone. So what's to stop them a year from now, two years, five years from now, coming in and say, I want to change that industrial over to another residential? You did it just a couple of years ago. So again, we talked about precedent. I think that's a big part of it. And uh, again, what Mr. Perillo said, I've known, uh, I've known him for a number of years, worked with him, and uh, I see his point of view. I see where we need to keep that because once it's gone, it is gone. Okay, once houses are built on there, you're not going to go back to industrial. They're not going to take those houses down. So I will be voting to deny this application. So, so, so a yes vote on this is to, in support of the motion, which is to deny the application. So um, any other commissioners have any comments? I'd just like to make one comment. Commissioner, Commissioner Coles, yep. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I do feel that uh, with regard to the complaints from the neighbors that um, there is still some hope for additional enforcement. And, and like you had mentioned earlier, um, when, the, when the last site visit was conducted, some of the, um, the on-site conditions didn't warrant uh, a notice of violation order or some other code enforcement action. But I believe that if future complaints do come in and they are warranted, I would strongly encourage our enforcement authority to execute um, with, the, with the greatest of vigor uh, an order to uh, direct that tenant to abate any of those violations that are found in our zoning ordinances. And, and with that, I believe that um, with, with strong enforcement, if uh, future issues do come up, I believe that the current use would be uh, acceptable uh, in the going future. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'd make another yeah. comment. Commissioner um, I, I also <coughs> agree with what, what the comment was just made, but I would also, uh, and I'm not sure whether you covered it or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but I wanna make sure that <clears throat> we aggressively uh, work with the zoning enforcement officer as, and, the, and the zoning that we get this buffer um, put in place that um, is supposed to be in place, that 30-foot buffer that's been torn out. I'd like to see that go back and be very aggressive <clears throat> about putting that back um, for the neighbors as part of this uh, um, application. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. I would also suggest. Yeah. Uh, I would also suggest that. Did you see her? Oh, did she, you see me? What, yeah. Sorry. Um, She's in the yeah. yeah. I would also recommend possibly <laughs> reviewing some of the complaints um, and seeing if there's something to be done in our review process of the uh, zoning regulations uh, in accordance with some of those complaints and see if we can integrate some of that into zoning, knowing that. I, I mean, listen. It comes down to this. What do we want Southington to look like in 2040? I know I'm going to be here, hopefully, if I can afford it. You know, so what is that area going to look like? And and some of those things were brought up. I don't disagree that it would probably be better suited as a as a residential community. But if we're going to leave it, we need to ensure that we're doing something for the citizens that came up here and told us about what was going on over there. Um, so I, I recommend that if, if this happens, that when we are reviewing those, those regulations, we, we reach out to those people and see, and, and other people living near an, an abutting industrial zone and see what their issues are. Um, that's the only way to really go forward with this. If we just do nothing, I'm, I'm a little worried that if we do nothing today and we just say, okay, no, um, again, what is our, what is our town going to look like in 2040? Uh, because 2020 came real fast. I don't know about y'all, <laughs> but I, I'm a little nervous about that. And again, I digress. 
No need to digress. I'm, to okay. I'm totally Commissioner, opposite. Commissioner I Lawrence. wanted to go and change this to residential. I feel for the neighbors. They're putting up with something that they shouldn't have to. Way back when, in the 1960s, 1970s, I'm going to date myself, but that area was clean, kept tidy. Now, look at it. We can't enforce anything. So you have it. Thank you, Sue. Any other comments? Right, everything was spoken for as things that I was going to state, so I have no comments, no further comments. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll say this. I mean, we, I started off coming in here as chairman, and one of the first things that I wanted to do, and, and we announced a couple, um, I think at the last meeting, that we established two different subcommittees. One was on regs review to look at our regs to make sure that they're, they're up to date and, in, and consistent with where we are today and, to, and where we're going tomorrow. To your, to your, to your, to your comment and, and one that was raised a number of times by somebody that I highly respect, Jen Clock, who used to sit up here, um, what do we want our town to look like moving forward? And that's, that was my vision with that. It was also my vision when I look at when we established the uh, the uh, subcommittee on on planning or uh, POCD because I don't look at that document as being one that once we adopt it, which we did in 2016 here, and I don't think any of us or maybe not I was most very, of us I was anyways very on that were, weren't here uh, on the committee when that was adopted. But I don't believe that that means that we should live with that for the next 10 years necessarily which is the state statutory requirement that we update it. So my hope was always to say, okay, we're gonna be proactive about things as opposed to being reactive to certain things. This piece of property is one where obviously I think all of us agree and we listened to a number of residents and we, we received all the, all the, all the uh, information that we received over the last three meetings where there's an issue with the tenant. Um, that issue really isn't something that really plays into our decision-making process as far as I'm concerned. And I, and I understand and I'm very sympathetic to what the plight that they've had to put up with. And I, and I hope that however this goes, that, that at some point we're able to either address it by, by enforcement action and, and I commit, and I've had several conversations with Rob and, and staff to make sure that we do everything within our powers to get out there and, and and try to make sure that there's conformity with what we, what the zoning regulations provide for on that piece of property, just as I would with any other piece of property in town. Um, I feel for the neighbors. I feel the, for the people who have to live there. I know that if I was one of them, I wouldn't want to live with that either. And I know people who have lived over there who have moved because of it. So, you know, I, I, I understand that. I hear Lou Perillo, I've listened to Lou Perillo and the town talk about the need for industrial, um, industrial um, zoned area. It is something that I think that we have not enough of. I know that, that if we let it go, it's not coming back. I also know that we could do anything we want here and this, this site can stay as it is for the foreseeable future. Um, and it, it doesn't mean necessarily it's gonna change tomorrow doesn't mean it's gonna change in 10 years. Um, we, could, we could vote to approve what, what Mark had put forward. Um, and 10 years from now, nothing could have happened. The same guy could be living there doing the same stuff that he's doing today. Um, I am encouraged by Rob's comments that he's working with, with staff to make sure that the buffer gets restored to what it should be. Um, and I'm hopeful that, that this neighbor um, who owns this property or at least is occupying this property now is one who decides that he's going to be a little bit more of a friendly neighbor than, than he seems to have been in the past. It wasn't easy though. Um, I was hopeful that we could reach some type of compromise. I know that, that Mark worked earnestly to try to, to try to accomplish that. I didn't necessarily think that, that those were bad ideas, I, I, but, uh, but they're not perfect. Um, but I'm always reminded, you know, not, not allowing the perfect to get in the way of the good. Um, having said that, yeah, you know, I, 
God, I can go either way, really. Um, but but I think that that in the interest of, of you know being hopeful that that we going forward that there's some type of a, a solution that comes to us outside on the on the side of caution and and vote in favor of this motion. So with that, Rob, if you can call the roll, please. Locks. No. Macchio. Yes. Volpe. No. Albanese. Yes. Coles. Yes. Salka. Yes. Hammersley. Yes. That's five two, in favor of denial. So motion motion passes. The application or the zone change application is denied. Um, items number eight B, C, and D. Um, I think that we're tabling those. Rob, do we need a motion to table those? The public hearing is still open. Uh, just by consensus that uh, you'll table it. So can we get a motion? Do we need to do each one separately? No, or? no. no just a consensus. Make a motion okay. to table. Yeah. Enter LLC. Yeah, I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So those four are tabled. Um, item number 8E, John J. Ron Canali, Jr. Ronchioli. 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 Yep, um, junior floodplain filling application for garage addition and driveway property located at 62 Echo Valley Road in an R2025 zone, parcel size 0.54 acres. And this is the favorable recommendation? Yeah, it's, it's gone through, yeah, Conservation Commission. It's now before uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, as usual. Um, I, I have no concerns over it. I don't know if engineering has a suggested, st suggested stipulation. Um, yeah, I just want to point out... Uh, concerning uh, the effort of Mr. Ronchioli's uh, design professionals. They really worked hard with the uh, staff in uh, getting many plan uh, revisions um, that we could support at this point in time. Uh, my only stipulation is um, the re there is a retaining wall that they're proposing along the uh, uh, driveway. Uh, that they're uh, modifying and uh, that will need to be designed by a Connecticut PE and a, and a building permit applied for. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jim. Do we have a motion on this? I'll make a motion to accept with the stipulations as stated by Mr. Capone. Mr. Bacchio makes a motion. Do we second. have a second? Second, Mr. Salka. Any further discussion? I just wanted to make one note of Coles, discussion. Yes, go. Um, and I don't know if this is the appropriate, and I apologize if I'm not in line. But um, in in observing the the aerial um, photography of the site, uh, it appears that the individual has annexed the town land adjacent to that property. And I just wanted to put it on record in this commission that a um, it was observed, and it, was there an answer given? To, to such an intrusion to, to, to town's property. Yeah, I, I believe that was brought up at the conservation level, um, including construction of the retaining wall and any improvements that will be totally done on the applicant's property. Um, I'm not sure if there was an encroachment. Yeah, that was brought up. unfortunately, we, we can find encroachments all over the place yeah. <laughs> in every say, town. It does say structures to yeah. be removed on the plan. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, as, as I can recall, he, he doubled his property size by taking hours. Is, is it appropriate, Rob, to provide that as part of a stipulation on this approval? or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it just happened as a matter of course anyway. It, it's, yeah, it's on the plan. Um, you know, typically, I don't know who actually writes letters to the, those who are encroaching on town property. I don't know if it's whether if it's Dave or if it's engineering. Um, well, he, well, he has to apply for a zoning permit. So yeah, we can, we can, yeah, we can, we can take care of it. Uh, so we'll but that's a cat and mouse game, obviously. Gotcha. <clears throat> um, I, I will note just that, that the Conservation Commission, which sent us a letter on that, does, does have the same stipulation that Jim had mentioned, um, both as part of the motion, but the same one that Jim Capone has mentioned, the town engineer. So, um, you satisfied with that answer? You, yes, sir. Okay. Is there any other um, comment before we take a vote on this from members of the commission? Seeing none, Rob, can you call the roll? Sure. Uh, Locks? Yes. Macchio? Yes. Volpe? Yes. Albanese? Yes. Coles? Yes. Uh, where am I? Salka? Yes. Hammersley? Yes. <clears throat> Seven. 
Seven zero. Seven zero. Seven zero. Motion passes. Um, item eight F, release of a nine thousand five hundred dollar E and S bond. <coughs> Tried it. Tradon, 168 Traden. Town Line Road, uh, SPR 1721. Make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Salka, second by Ms. Locks. Do we have any conversation, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Locks? Yes. Macchio? Yes. Volpe? Yes. Albanese? Yes. Coles? Yes. Salka? Yes. Hammersley? <coughs> yes. 7 0 motion passes. Item 8G, release of a $10,100 an ENS bond. Old Orchard Estates, 229 Wonk Spring Road, uh, S number 1296. Do we Make have a motion? motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Second. Salka, second by Ms. Albanese. Any discussion? Seeing none, Rob, please call the roll. Locks? Yes. Macchio? Yes. Volpe? Yes. Albanese? Yes. Coles? Yes. Salka? Yes. Hammersley? Yes. 7 0 motion passes. Item number 8H, reduction of an ENS bond. From ten thousand dollars to a new amount of two thousand five hundred dollars, one sixty one Birch Street, SPR one seven six eight. Do I have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Salka. <coughs> Second. Second by Mr. Macchio. Any discussion? Yeah. What was the re reason for the reduction? Ms. Albanese, reason for the reduction. Do we know? Uh, the basically, um, the applicant uh, complied with the site plan. Uh, they have received a certificate of occupancy. However, um, Mr. Lavalley just probably had some concerns on some, you know, because we're in final we're stabilization. In the winter, right, right, right. Winter okay. months, so he'd Excellent. probably just review it in the spring. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, sorry. Nope. That's that's <laughs> question. a relevant question. So, favor, I guess. any any other question? Any other questions for the commission? Rob, call the roll, please. Box. Yes. Macchio. Yes. Baldy. Yes. Albanese? Yes. Coles? Yes. Salka? Yes. Hammersley? Yes. 7 0 motion passes. Item number 8 I. Request for the first 90 day extension to file a Mylar Balmar Estate Subdivision 61 Westwood Road S 1325. Do we need a motion on this, Rob? Or? Yeah, I mean, all of these, the bond releases, I mean, they all need motions. They don't necessarily need a roll call individual vote, but it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, motion yep. to accept. Motion, Mr. Macchio. But this is for extension. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm first. saying. Is oh, yeah. This is why are they extending? So they get, uh, they, by statute, they get two 90-day extensions. Uh, they're, they need this extension because they're closing after the original 90 days after it approves. So this is very, this is pretty typical, actually. Plus the bond. We haven't received oh, and you haven't received the bond yet? Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Thank you. We have a second. Yes. Uh -oh. Second, Miss Locks. We just do a voice vote on this, Rob? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Administrative items number item number nine on the agenda. I'll just note that there was a an email that came to everybody, I think, um, from Karen that talked to a land use academy that we're gonna be holding yes. here on the fifth of February at seven o'clock. Again, I think I, I talked about this when we, we came together for the first time on the seventeenth of November. I encourage everybody to be here. I will be here. Um, I, you know, even though you may be doing this for a while, I think there's still stuff to learn, and I think that it helps, especially those people who are new to this game, to understand what we do and, and why we do it and how we do it and all that kind of stuff. It's a very informative thing. Rob, do you have anything? Yeah, to I was going to say we've extended the invitation to Conservation Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals, so. Uh, I just need to have have a head count because I'm gonna buy some pizza and some sodas. That's how you got me. I'm. We we, we, we we had cookies and brownies last time, but that that wasn't a hit. So I'm gonna do the pizza this time. Free meal a year, not bad. Millennials literally. I can't I can't roll in a keg. I mean, unless we turn the cameras off. Can we give you our um our our vote now as far as registration that we will. Yeah, I mean if you have a if you if you can all make it just, you know, let me know. I think that Karen I think the Karen asked that everybody yeah. reply back to her by That's the easiest date thing for me to make sure for her to calculate a, that. that yeah. account. So nope, um, and as you said it was extended to other other groups as well. So Yeah, and, and our 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 guide will be Bruce Hyde uh, with with he needs a former uh, land use planner. Um, he'll have a nice interactive uh, uh, remote control question and answer type thing. So it won't be like going to sleep boring. No, we, we did this two years ago. But she had three pieces of pizza. Yeah. We did this two years ago, and I, and again, I thought it was a, it was a good um, 
time to, to sit there and, and sort of get some some ideas and thoughts and stuff. So. Yeah, I would. I, I count for maybe an hour, hour and a half tops. You know, it depends on how many questions are yeah. asked. Could we have the session recorded? I, I, I have a conflict. I don't think I can make it. I, I don't I really like to see. Think that. we record it? Well, they ha he what he can do is he can provide his PowerPoint. But I think there is one actually a sample one online Posted. through that link that I had sent out. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure I can get the PowerPoint, and it's just a matter of going through it, obviously. Yeah, yeah the power there's a PowerPoint already online. It's a little dated, but I yeah. But to get some someone to come in and videotape and everything, we're talking about hundreds of dollars. And oh, we wouldn't we couldn't use a system. No. <clears throat> Any other administrative items? None? Okay, we have a couple things, uh, item number 10 coming up. Rob, you want to talk about that? Uh, just we received new applications for AutoZone on Meriden Waterbury Turnpike. It's a brand new building next to the Blimpies, between Blimpies and uh, I guess it's Home Depot. Uh, and then an addition on Meriden Waterbury Turnpike at Lin, Lin, Lineberry, Lineberry Realty. And then, of course, Oak Hill Cemetery is expanding because I guess business is good. Um, <laughs> But it's actually, I will note You've that. You've been waiting all day for that. It, I have been. I woke up this morning. I couldn't wait to mention it. So, but I will say uh, in all seriousness, uh, we, we've seen a lot of activity on Meredith Waterbury Turnpike of late, which I think is a fantastic thing that's because that's obviously been an area that's been a little depressed over time, mm -hmm. and it's getting a shot in the arm. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Hey, Traffic's, you know, it's, it, it's the second highest uh, yeah. traverse corridor in our town. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, traffic, I think traffic it's, is down. What's that? <laughs> that's is on that the tongue in cheek or what? That's, that's on the record. <laughs> I hope so. my tongue's in my cheek. <laughs> okay, so item number 11, we're going into executive session. Just from a legal standpoint, we're going to be on members of the commission, uh, Attorney Taylor, as well as the esteemed Attorney Footner will be joining us in there, as well as Rob Phillips. I don't think that there's a need for anybody else so we'll adjourn well could I get a motion to adjourn into executive session motion to adjourn and second. go into executive session second all those in favor uh, Mr. Salka, Salka. Mr. Salka I'm sorry all those in favor aye, aye. all those opposed and uh, we'll go into the side room um, how long we think this is going to take no, I think he said we don't have five minutes hours. five to ten hours. minutes yeah. an hour hours. 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 Hours.